sooner we start, sooner we start, sooner we finish. Will the meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission for Wednesday, December 15th, 2021, please come to order. This evening's meeting will be a virtual planning and zoning meeting hosted by Zoom. During this meeting, our procedures will be as follows. One, when you first enter the meeting, you'll be in the virtual waiting room until the meeting host admits you. Two, please be aware that your camera, if you have one in your microphone, will be muted by the meeting host when you enter the meeting. You can turn on your camera at any time so you can be seen by others if you choose to. In order to run an efficient and orderly meeting in this virtual environment, unless stated otherwise by the meeting chairman during the meeting, the meeting host will keep everyone other than the commission members muted. You will still be able to hear everything said by the commission members, even if you're muted and or your camera is not on. There will be the opportunity for public comment during a public hearing, at which time public participants will be unmuted. Three, the secretary will read the call of the meeting as published according to Governor Lamont's executive order. Four, during the public hearing, the applicant will be invited to present the application, explaining to the commission and others present what is being requested. The meeting host will share all related documents on screen as needed. In addition, all applications and supporting materials for each application on the agenda are available through the public meeting calendar page of the town website, www.ci.guilford.ct.us, and through a direct link on the planning and zoning page. Five, comments of town agencies for each application, if there are any, will be read. Then there will be clarifying questions from commissioners. Then there will be opportunity for clarifying questions from the audience. Please raise your hand through the Zoom platform and wait to be called on and unmuted. First, those who wish to support the application may come forward. And second, those who oppose the application may then come forward. As this is a public hearing, it must be recorded. It is necessary for speakers to identify themselves each time uh, they speak by stating their name and address. Seven, the applicant will then have the opportunity to address any questions or concerns raised by the public or commissioners. Eight, once the public hearing is closed, the applicant is free to leave or remain for the balance of the public hearing and the regular meeting during which the commission will try and reach a decision on each application. Okay. Each applicant will be notified in writing as to the decision of this commission and has the right to appeal to superior court if desired. Nine decisions of this meeting are available the day after the meeting by calling the planning and zoning department at 203-453-8039 or emailing planning.zoning at ci.guilford.ct.us after 9 a.m. 10, all actions taken by the commission will be on a roll call vote. All commissioners and staff will identify themselves to the record before speaking. Seated this evening are the following members. I'd ask that you raise your hand and identify yourself as I call you, Sean Cosgrove. Thank you. Uh, I don't see Frank. Did he end up showing up? Yeah, he's here. He just came. Oh, Frank just D'Andrea. Right. Oh, okay. I don't see Frank yet. He's but... connecting. He's still connecting. Though. All right. We'll come back to Frank just to say hi. Jamie Stein. Good evening. Thank you. Richard Wallace. Hello. Scott Edmond. Hello. Bill Freeman. Hello. I'm Phil Johnson, and we are waiting for Frank D'Andrea. Um, that gives us a group of seven, so everyone is seated. Um, seated this evening for staff are George Crawl, our town planner and current zoning acting enforcement officer, Lisa Piombino, our planning and zoning administrative assistant. This meeting will be recorded via the Zoom platform and made available at the town website for viewing. The secretary will now read the legal notice. Oh, hold on one second. Good evening, sure. Frank, wave your hand. That's Frank D'Andrea. He's a commission member also. The secretary will now read the legal notice. Uh, notice is hereby given that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing on December 15, 2020. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting will be conducted through a web and phone meeting only. Attendees are advised to not go to the regular community center location because a physical meeting will not take place. See below sign in information uh, to the Zoom meeting. Uh, the following applications will be heard. Matthew Griswold, seven, uh, 271, three mile course, map 70, lot 20A, zone R8 slash R3, special permit for construction of a barn. F.J. Corsini II, LLC, uh, 591 Sawmill Road, map 85, lot 63-1, zone R5, four lot re-subdivision. Christopher Healy, uh, Boston Post Road, Map 78, lot 13, zone TS-2 slash R8, 
uh, petition for zone boundary change. Eagle View Homes LLC, 405 Whitfield Street, Map 28, Lot 5, Zone I-1, Special Permit, Site Plan, and Coastal Site Plan to demolish the existing site and construct three 5,962 square feet residential buildings with underground parking and three uh, to four bedroom units. Crystal Gaudio and David White, uh, 23 Saw Pit Road, map 34, lot 30, zone R3, coastal site plan for hand demolition and rebuild of house and greenhouse. Copies of these applications are available for inspection in the Planning and Zoning Office and on the town's website, www.ci.guilford.ct.us. At this hearing, persons may attend by either phone or web connection and shall be heard. Pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order 7B, any materials relevant to matters on the agenda, including but not limited to materials related to specific applications, if applicable, shall be submitted to the agency a minimum of 24 hours prior and posted to the agency's website for public inspection prior to, during, and after the meeting. And any exhibits to be submitted by members of the public shall, to the extent feasible, be submitted to the agency a minimum of 24 hours prior to the meeting and posted to the agency's website for public inspection prior to, during, and after the meeting. All written correspondence shall be submitted to planning.zoning at ci.guilford.ct.us. Documents are available at the Planning and Zoning Office Dial 203-453-8039 for assistance. In accordance with the Governor's Executive Order 7I, this legal notice is being published on the Guilford, uh, Town of Guilford website, www.ci.guilford.ct.us, dated at Guilford, Connecticut, this 30th day of November uh, 2021, Phil Johnson, Chairman. Thank you very much. Would someone like to make a motion to open? So moved. Thank you. Sean with a second, I'll call the vote. Sean Cosgrove? You need to unmute. Well, I'll, I'll take your hand raised, but if you could unmute, we'll get a, a full eye out of you. Aye. Frank D'Andrea. Aye. Jamie Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace. Yes. Scott Edmond. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. I'll also vote to open. The meeting is open. Crystal Gaudio and David White, 23 Saw Pit Road, map 34, lot 30. Zone R3 coastal site plan for hand demolition and rebuild of house and greenhouse. Uh, is someone here to present for Crystal and David and or are they here for themselves? Yes, uh, sir, oh, here we are. If you I'm can David, name is, and, yeah, name and address for the record would be great. Yes, David White, 80 Boulder Road, Guilford. And Crystal Gaudio, 80 Boulder Road, Guilford. This is our temporary address. Okay. So the, the work being done is at 23 Saw Pit Road? Yes. yes, sir. Okay, sorry. Just <laughs> you, can, uh, you can present your plans, uh, Crystal and David. Great. Share your uh, screen. We'll go ahead and share screen. Thank you. Uh, Okay, thanks everybody for giving us the opportunity to share this with you. Um, my name's David White. Uh, I have a, a business called Right Environments, uh, which is uh, dedicated to making more sustainable buildings. I do the engineering work for insulating and air sealing and heating and cooling and ventilating buildings. Um, and my wife, Crystal, is a landscape architect, uh, also very focused on uh, environmental issues, including native habitat. That's relevant because we want to use 23 Saw Pit as uh, a laboratory for that for that work. We want to develop that work and uh, and, and use it as part of our business efforts. Um, here is an image of 23 Saw Pit, and I'm going to show you. Oops, here we go. Uh, here's an aerial view. Uh, this is the house. Um, it's on a hill along Saw Pit Road overlooking the marsh. Down here is the Grass Shack and Jacobs Beach. Uh, and down here is some wetland that's also on the property. Uh, by the way, I grew up in Guilford on Dunk Rock Road. I'm trying to change my slide here, but it's not. Okay, there we go. Here's our, here's our proposed plan. Um, uh, this outline is the property. This is tidal wetland. Uh, this is the hill that I just pointed out. 
And um, I want to point out that uh, as the nature of our businesses reflects, uh, Crystal and I are uh, tree huggers, for lack of a better term. Um, we have made valiant efforts to save the existing structure, uh, but for reasons that I'm going to show you, uh, we just couldn't find a way to make that happen. So our proposal is to uh, remove the wood framing on the existing foundations and then build a new house on those foundations with the intention being uh, for there to be no soil disturbance uh, in order to uh, uh, take proper care of the wetland downhill from us. And again, we're here tonight because as you can see, this heavy dotted line, which is the 100 foot offset from the wetland border, um, uh, the house and also this existing uh, derelict structure both uh, cross that line. In addition to minimizing the environmental impact of the construction, as I said, we have these businesses that are very sustainability focused. Our intent is to build a net zero energy house, which we wouldn't be able to do if we were keeping the existing structure. Uh, and also reuse material from the existing structure in the new structure. Um, and Crystal has this intention uh, for the site as well. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, I just by chance met the previous owner this week. They, he still owns the property across the street and had some mail from us. And I found out that he purchased this property 40 years ago with the intent of eventually living in it himself, redeveloping it. Um, and never got around to it. Because of that, he rented the house for 40 years and didn't do much to the land. Um, because of that, uh, the, the house is not in great shape, which David will show some pictures of that. But also the site is, is amazing in many ways. It, um, it has wetland, it has forest, it has shrubbed areas, it has a, a place for meadow. Um, and it has an enormous number of invasive plants, but also a great number of native plants. So my plan is to uh, replace the invasive plants with native plants um, without using any heavy machinery. We'll use sheet mulching, solarizing, and hand removal, and then plant natives in those areas. Um, so the existing house, uh, is, why is it hard? Okay, here's the existing house. Um, the siding is asbestos shingle. So all of that needs to come off for safety, especially because much of it is failing. Um, and underneath that siding is the original siding, which is wood, but was painted with lead paints. So that's coming off as well. Um, uh, just a quick image of a single story portion in back that I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, there's a severe roof leak there um, that I'll come back to. These are the stone walls of the, uh, of the shed in back. As you can see, the roof collapsed a long time ago, uh, but we think these walls are beautiful. They're made from the same stone on which they rest, uh, and most of the structure is directly on bedrock. Uh, so we intend to repair that structure and put a roof onto it. Uh, I talked about roof leaks. There are at least three major areas of roof leakage. Uh, you can see uh, uh, water damage inside the building, uh, most notably here. So this is under the single story roof. This was here the day we walked in to look at the building. And when we took the finishes off, we found that uh, the mud sill, that is the sill plate uh, that rests directly on the stone foundation is completely rotted out in that part of the building and would have to be replaced. Uh, at great expense. And that's happening in, in two different locations in the house. There was also a fire in the house that was completely covered over uh, and there were some repairs made, but as you can see here by this member that is actually splitting, that's not an illusion, it really is breaking. Um, there were many areas that need repair uh, that, that, didn't, that didn't get it. We also hired a structural engineer to assess um, not just the rot and the fire damage, but the structure as a whole. And it turned out that a large portion of its assessment was that from day one, this structure was not anywhere near contemporary standard. Uh, it was built in, I think, 1892, we understand. 
Um, there are places where there should be a ridge beam, but there isn't one. There are places where the collar ties are too high and also too weak to properly support the structure. And you can see where the roof is sagging and separating as a result. There are places where rafters should have been tied to, to studs. There are places where um, uh, uh, beams or joists are too deeply notched and so they're splitting. So there's really nothing that we can save without very expensively building a fully functional structure within and around what is there already. The structure engineer told us we would have to sheathe the entire building in new sheathing um, and just encase all that wood and not really make any use of it. So alternatively, what we'd like to do is deconstruct the house, which means that instead of having heavy equipment come and knock it down, we're going to have a crew come and take it apart piece by piece, stockpile all those pieces, uh, Klaus Armster, who is from Guilford and has a very large reclaimed wood business, will remill much of that wood. We have chestnut, we have vertical grain heart pine, we have old growth spruce, we have high quality pine, and we plan to reuse that uh, in ways that are particularly suited to modern times. We don't build structure out of, um, out of chestnut anymore, uh, but chestnut is really great for countertops and stair treads and so forth. Uh, it's a very high quality, very valuable wood. By doing this deconstruction, we're minimizing the creation of dust, and we're also um, reusing that material in order to minimize the environmental impact of the new construction. Yes. Um, also, because the house that we propose is approximately the same, same size as what's existing, we do plan on using the existing well and using the existing septic without making any major changes to those. Correct. The, the main focus here is to minimize site disturbance. We're not gonna dig around the foundation. We're not gonna alter the foundation. Uh, we're not gonna alter any of this masonry work here. Uh, maybe one or two areas of uh, digging a couple of feet wide uh, to repair some major leaks in the foundation, but otherwise nothing. In fact, there's a lot of leakage here because the bedrock slopes from this point down uh, through the house. And so by putting a carport in a shed here, we can just keep the rain off that sector of land and thereby minimizing uh, the flooding of the basement. Um, this area is proposed as a greenhouse and this would be a two-story structure. So uh, just to give a picture of what that would look like, it's like this. Um, this whole south facing 1212 uh, slope would be devoted to a photovoltaic array, which would make the house net zero, uh, including a future electric car. Um, this area would be roofed and serve as uh, eventually as an office. Uh, and then uh, a couple of modest size uh, porches on the south and west sides. We are, we have hired Duo Dickinson to be our architect. And we're working with him now. We're going back and forth in a kind of concept schematic design. And this sketch is based on a sketch that he made for us. Yes. One of the rules of making net zero energy buildings in this climate is that you don't put too much glass on the house. And so we're trying to make a traditional modest looking form. It's not meant to be anything uh, ostentatious by, by any stretch. Just to give a sense of scale, the existing house is 22 by 30. So it's 660 gross square feet, about 1300 total gross square feet across two floors. Um, and uh, you can see the layout, everything is, much of it is the code minimum, a three foot wide hallway, uh, a three foot wide half bath, uh, four foot wide full bath and so forth, uh, uh, eight foot wide kids bedroom. Um, so we're, uh, we're not looking to do anything big and, that's part of our ethic and it's also a way that we can make this work on the existing foundation. Um, so for us, uh, you know, we, we recognize that this is happening within 100, 100 feet of the wetland and we take that very seriously, but we think that by, by working with this thing, we can not only minimize the site disturbance and the ecological disturbance in general, but we can also really enhance the site. Uh, we can, we can remove invasives and make a great wildlife habitat by planting uh, native plants. And we can make a net zero energy structure, which to us is uh, a big step forward in, uh, ecologically. Uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. If wow. you have questions, um, we're here. You know, 
Phil Johnson, I, can I ask a couple questions and, and feel free to, <laughs> so um, I live on Whitfield Street and similar to you, I, I own an old house. It was built in 1859 and it has a stone foundation, uh, which is the bane of my existence. For one of <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I truly, and I, it doesn't make any difference from our perspective, um, but um, for your, you know, if I can share my experience, <laughs> I, I, I don't, unless you've got gutters piping off water, you're going to have a wet basement through a stone foundation. So it just kind of, which creates a whole set of problems unto itself with, you know, mold issues and animals and mice and hopefully not anything bigger than mice, but I've had things that are bigger than mice. So I would, you know, I, I applaud you for, and we did the same thing. So don't, don't get, you know, <laughs> um, you know the, the difference was we had a two foot crawl space, which we dug out by hand, which again, I, we were, I was probably about your age when I did it. And it was probably one of the, the sillier things that I did. Um, but I, I appreciate all your efforts to, to keep it as sustainable, but I, I would implore you to at least potentially rethink the stone foundation. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 concrete is, the, the concrete is really one of the least expensive elements of the construction project. And you could keep the stone and repurpose it. Um, right. That's, you know, it's your project. I'm just throwing it out. Thank you. Um, any questions from commissioners? So what we're doing, this is merely a, a coastal site plan. We probably have a few letters to read into the record, I would think. Correct, George? Uh, we certainly have one from Kevin McGee. So Scott, you want to grab that one from Kevin? So uh, David and Crystal, what we'll do is we'll read in kind of any comments from town staff, and then we'll um, take questions from commissioners and then questions from anyone else and then comments and support and comments and against. Okay. Great. Great. So uh, Scott, if you could grab Kevin's, that would be terrific. Yeah, this is dated December 14, 2021 to Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission from Kevin McGee, Environmental Planner, RE, this project. Uh, the applicant is proposing a hand uh, to hand demolish the existing buildings and re rebuild them on the existing foundations, which will be repaired. Work also includes the hand removal of invasive plants with replanting of native plantings and shrubs. Stormwater from the roof leaders will be discharging to rain barrels and rain gardens. The coastal resource policy, uh, polices applicable, policies applicable for the property are coastal hazard area <clears throat> and escarpments, uh, estuarine embayment and tidal wetlands. Uh, the site plan provides for erosion and sedimentation control measures that are designed to protect the adjacent coastal resources. The work being conducted could have a minor impact on the adjacent coastal resources if the erosion and sedimentation control measures are not properly installed and maintained. In order to make sure that the coastal resources are protected, I recommend the following conditions of approval. Uh, one, the Town of Guilford Zoning Enforcement Officer should be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures prior to site construction. Soil stockpiles should be contained by silt fencing or hay bales. Soil erosion and sedimentation control me measures shall be maintained until vegetation is established or suitable material is installed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement. Um, that's it. Super. Uh, Jamie, looks like we have a letter from Shirley Mitkins. Would you like to take that one? Sure will. To Planning and Zoning Commission from Shirley Mitkins, RS, date December 14th, 2021, regarding 23 Saw Pit Road, Map 34, Lot 30, uh, teardown, rebuild, and accessory structure. The application for a teardown rebuild on the same footprint and accessory structure slash greenhouse located at the property referenced above will need a B100A application from the health department. The existing septic system is approved for a four bedroom home per the permit to discharge. The health department will need additional information to approve the plan, such as an interior plan, septic system inspection by a licensed subsurface sewage disposal system contractor, and a permit to construct to connect the existing system to the house. 
any increase in bedrooms would require additional information. Shirley Mickens, RS. Thank you. Uh, let's see. No, I think those are the only two letters. Is that correct, George? It looks like it. I yeah. believe it is. Yes, that's that's correct. Um, so can I ask another question just out of curiosity, David, Crystal? Are you, are you guys pulling the asbestos siding off or are you having someone else do it? Uh, yes, sir. I'm pulling it off myself. Be careful. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a, a, a P100 respirator uh, and, and a Tyvek suit. Yeah. Um, I, I, I believe it, having um, done something similar to that um, with a house with lead paint, um, I know that the, the cost to have a contractor do that is um, on the verge of insane because they, I think they literally have to bubble the house. Um, but if you do it as a homeowner, those requirements are, are not the same. Bill, you might be able to chip in and tell me if I'm right about that or not. That's what, that's what we found. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's that is true. Oh, again, uh, yeah. you still I, have to be careful. I was about to say, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in the safety, I'm in the insurance business on the side kind of, uh, and, and we always joke, safety is no accident. So just, you know, make sure you're doing everything to protect yourselves um, to the best of your ability. Uh, are there any questions from commissioners with respect to this application? Yeah, I, I've got a few, Phil. Um, so um, I'm not sure I saw in the application and I may have missed it. Um, this has got to be in what zone is a, of the flood zone? Are it's, they? It's very high. Sorry, go ahead. I think we're 20 feet above. Um, I think 26 feet is the highest point of the hill, and the house is at about 20 feet above the. Um, tidal. I, I grew up not far from there. <laughs> and, and, it's uh, a funny little hill. Uh, Sean, actually. <laughs> If you don't mind, I'll answer your question because I did a little due diligence beforehand. Okay. Uh, um, David, is it okay if I screen share? Uh, yes, please. Um, okay. I mean, but, you know, I'll just I'll just add. You know, twenty feet. I mean, you know, I've been down there over the course of my life, and um, the water can get pretty high. Hold on a second. Sean. There you Not go. That high. Uh, hold on, Sean. Yep. Can you guys see the screen that I'm sharing now? I can. Okay. So this is the railroad track, and here's the house yep. that we're talking about. Right. So it's 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 quite high. Sorry. It's quite high. I mean, I, I'm not see what the. Uh, I'm just zooming out so you get a perspective about where we're talking about uh, the yeah. height. So that, yeah. that's always one of the, the things I look at. Um, so from a, from a building standpoint, they're well out of the flood zone. Well, um, okay. Um, I, I just, I would assume that David and Crystal have, you know, thought through this project and, you know, I mean, just given the elevation of, you know, water levels and, storm severity I, I just want to be sure you're doing the right thing that's yeah. bringing up yes here. sir um yes sir and that was one of our issues with the existing construction was that um we we want to be ready for hurricane force winds and we didn't think there was a, a viable way to do that with the existing structure so uh sean i'll do one more screen share just to give you some perspective um, here, here's where their house is. And then I live down here on Whitfield Street here. <laughs> um, but th this is all very high ground. It's flood zone X. So, you know, if you're in AE, even during the hurricanes, you know, we really didn't get, you know, we have water on the street, but, you know, they're not going to be subject to wave action because of the railroad tracks in the way. And it's high. So, just thought I'd share that as well. Any other questions from commissioners? No. Uh, Richard Wallace. 
Yeah, good after, good evening. There was no need for deep. I guess more. This goes more to George. Deep didn't have to weigh in on this at all. No, we don't. We don't. We don't routinely uh, refer CAM applications to them anymore. Okay, because we spent a good deal of time in the past. Right. With all, safe the sound and wasn't as productive as we wanted. I mean, and, and I know the distance away primarily. It's closer to Mars than it is to the sound, but. Bill, I had a similar sort of question. This is Jamie. Um, this didn't go before the wetlands committee. There are no wet inland wetlands on the property. Tidal wetlands, but not inland wetlands. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? And I, I think it's, it's uh, important to note that the 100 foot buffer is just a upland review area. Is that correct, Phil? Mm -hmm. that, that's what makes them subject to the coastal site plan process. Right. But uh, you can have wetlands off the property, but still fall within the right. purview of the 100 foot. So that's more for so Jamie had knew that. Uh, are there any questions from the public? Remember, uh, if your camera's not on and you want to raise your hand, I can't see you. So I, I don't know. So are there any questions from the public with respect to this application? Uh, would anyone, without further questions, um, would anyone like to speak in favor of this application? Would anyone like to speak against this application? With no comments either for or against, uh, and comments from town agencies written in, and a very nice presentation from David and Crystal, would someone like to make a motion to close? Motion, motion to close. close. Second. Uh, all right, Lisa, I'll leave that to you. Figure out. Uh, Sean Cosgrove? Aye. Frank D'Andrea? Yes. Jamie Stein? Yes. Richard Wallace? Yes. Scott Edmund? Yes. Bill Freeman? Yes. Well, as a vote to close, we'll act on this tonight. Um, I can't promise you when, um, but you can also um, give Lisa a call in the morning and get the results. But I, I feel comfortable with it, but we'll see how all the commissioners end up. Um, next Hi, uh, sorry, this is a member of the public. My mute button was sticking, so I wasn't okay. able to respond in time. Sure, but I would could, like to, I'd could, like to su support uh, this project. Thank you. If you could just quickly state your name and address for the record, that would be appreciated. Uh, this is Aaron Alvey, three twenty nine Three Mile Course. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Um, since we already voted to close, we'll just add that. As public knowledge. Yeah, sorry about that. It's not a problem. Uh, next item on our agenda is Matt Griswold, 271 Three Mile Course, Map 70, Lot 20A, Zone R8 slash R3, special permit to construct a barn. I'm assuming Matt's barn is over 750 square feet, and that's why he's here. Matt, is Matt here? Hi, Matt. Welcome. Hello. If you can state your name and address, that would be great. Hi, this is Matt Griswold. I live at 271 Three Mile Course, and I am working with Jim Preddy from Chris Gulo Engineering uh, regarding this project. Uh, good evening, folks. Jim Preddy, Chris Gulo Engineering. Uh, we did a um, survey in the plan here for the proposed barn. Um, 271 Three Mile Course is a very rear uh, lot, uh, if you will. You cannot see the house at all from the road. Um, in fact, the driveway kind of goes around another house. Uh, it's a very unique property. Um, and uh, the driveway that's on the plan, um, I don't know, George, can you share the plan? Yeah, I'm gonna let you share it if I can find you on the list here. There you go. Or, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm gonna- George, actually, my computer can can share if you don't mind giving me permission. Uh, Matthew, you want, you're gonna do it? Okay. Yeah, I'll have him do it. Okay, let me uh, see if I can find you on this long list of participants here. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually working from home and last time you, you folks shared the plan, so I didn't, I'm not. Right, we, I'm not. <laughs> we're letting you do it this, this way. That's Forever right. evolving, Jim, that's what's happening. <laughs> We've only been doing this for like a year. You know. no, maybe two, maybe two, coming up on two, you know. 
Yeah, the, the official notice talks about uh, don't go, go to normal place. And I'm like, there isn't really a normal place anymore. <laughs> you should be able to do it, Matt. There you go. There he is. So um, you can see the driveway kind of comes in from the right-hand side of the plan and uh, comes, uh, that's the left side, comes in from the other side, from the left, from the right-hand side of the plan and kind of curves to the right and goes uh, to the north uh, or to the top and goes around uh, the, the house, which is up on a hill. That driveway is low and there's a hill that goes up to the house. And then at the end of the driveway is where we're planning on putting this barn. Um, really, truly the only accessible part of the property from a vehicle is, is that spot from the end of the driveway. The only other flat spot is where the septic system uh, exists now uh, to the right-hand side of the driveway as you're making a curve. Uh, we did uh, go to wetlands. We had a site walk and a wetland meeting uh, with the wetland commission. Uh, they had asked us to try to reduce the, the um, affected area, uh, which we did by uh, incorporating uh, so a little bit taller re uh, foundation walls and also some boulder retaining walls because there's, uh, as common in Guilford, there's many, many boulders on this property um, right in this area, in fact. Um, so we're doing some short uh, uh, boulder walls and then some extra concrete walls. So we were able to minimize quite a bit the, the amount of uh, grading that we'll have to do, uh, which the end of result of that is we'll have to take down far fewer trees than originally proposed. Um, we do also have a picture. Um, there's a uh, architectural picture of the barn. Uh, just kind of FYI. Up. I'll pull that up. Um, but yeah, the uh, the footprint of the barn is 1360. So it's a 30 by 40 barn with a small little 10 by 16 appendage, uh, as you can see in the in the drawings. <laughs> And that's it. Um, we did uh, we did get wetland approval after the changes, and um, we did hear from the health department that they were uh, okay with the project as well. Um, so now we're here for the special exception for you folks. Uh, any septic um, or or facility sinks, things like that going in? No. Oh. Jim, no plumbing? No plumbing. Strictly a work farm, so it's going to be pretty boring. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, looks like a fun project. You know, it's built on a slab, I'm assuming? Yes. Great. Uh, any questions from commissioners with respect to this application? I don't, do, do we have any other? Um, Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah, two. Great. There is a, there, there is a letter. Yeah. Uh, Sean, you want to grab one? The first one? Uh, there's one from Kevin McGee, environmental planner, uh, regarding a special permit for Matthew Wiswold, uh, 271 Three Mile Course, Guilford, Connecticut. <clears throat> Sister map, 70 lot 20A. The applicant is proposing to construct an approximately Three by four foot barn on a hillside adjacent to the existing driveway. Roof water will infiltrate into a two foot by two foot deep crushed stone trench located under the drip line. The plans for the project have sedimentation and erosion control procedures that are in compliance with 273-97B subsection six of the zoning regulations. Um, silt fence has been installed down gradient the construction area. Inland wetlands are located west of the proposed barn. The Guilford Inland Wetlands Commission at its December 8th, 2021 meeting approved a regulated activity for the construction of a new 1,360 foot 
square foot barn within 100 feet jurisdictional review zone as shown on property located at 271 Three Mile Course, Gilbert, Connecticut. Proposed site plan prepared by Scolo Engineering dated October 21st, 2021, last revised December 2nd, 2021 with conditions. In order to make sure the natural resources are protected, I recommend the following conditions of approval. The town of uh, Guilford Zoning Enforcement Officer should be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures. That's it. Thank you. Uh, one Frank, more. We got one more from Shirley Minkins. Frank, do you want to grab that? Sure. This one is. I can screen share it up if you want. I got it somewhere okay. around here. I got you. Hold on. It. There you go. 271, three mile course. And this is from Shirley Minkins, RS. The application for an accessory structure barn, no plumbing, located at the property referenced above, meets the requirements for a 19 13 B100A. The accessory structure must be 10 feet or more from the subsurface sewage disposal system. The structure will not reduce the potential repair area for the subsurface sewage disposal system. The applicant will need to apply for a B100A application from the health department before final approval is granted. Shirley Minkins, RS. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's it, but let me just make sure. Yep, that's our next one. Um, so I will stop screen sharing. Any questions from commissioners with respect to that, this application? Are there any questions from the public with respect to this application? Would anyone like to speak in favor or against this application? With no comments either for or against, uh, would someone like to make a motion to close? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Uh, Paul Gloat, Sean Cosgrove. Aye. Frank D'Andrea. Aye. Amy Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace. Yes. Todd Edmond. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. I'll also vote to close and we'll act on that this evening. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, looks like a fun project. Thank uh, you very next, much. Next Thank item you. is uh, FJ Corsini II LLC or two LLC. 591 Sawmill Road, Map 85, Lot 63-1, Zone R5, Four Lot Resubdivision. I believe Attorney Beatty is here for this. I am, and I'm also joined by uh, Mark Young and uh, Dirk Goss from Waldo and Associates, and Mr. Corsini is here as well. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Beatty for uh, the applicant, Sullivan Griffith and Beatty, 705 Boston Post Road, Guilford. Um, so this resubdivision application, uh, just before we get into the, before I turn it over to Dirk and uh, Mark, this is uh, a set of unusual circumstances to, uh, to, to say the least. So this property uh, at the corner of Sawmill Road and Flat Meadow Road, um, it consisted of, in 1963, the Volpe family, Madeline and Vincent Volpe, bought this land from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stone. And then they owned it until, oh, they continued to own it until, the family owned it until earlier this year. Uh, in 1980, they applied for and received approval of a three-lot subdivision, which is the parcels on our plan. And George, I don't know if you want to Put this up or Dirk and Mark if you want to put it up on this on the screen, which consists of lots one, two, and three of what, what the applicant is proposing this evening. They then acquired, um, they also acquired in 1981 a portion of land from the town on the corner of Flat Meadow Road and um, Mill Road, and that rounds out uh, or add those are added to lots two and three. And subdivision. 
Mark, can uh, you can you can uh, screen share now if you want to. You should be able to. Okay. Sorry. Great. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. So it's a three lot subdivision that was approved in 1980. The it was revised in 1981 with the addition of uh, the a bit of the corner where Sawmill Road and Flat Meadow Road intersected. In 1991, the neighboring property owner to the south, Mr. Lally, subdivided his property and he created what uh, a two lot subdivision and then conveyed what is now lot four of our proposed resubdivision uh, as part of his subdivision. <clears throat> Subsequent to that, in late 1991, Mr. Lally conveyed and Mrs. Lally conveyed their lot one, our proposed lot four, to Mr. and Mrs. Volpe. They continued to own the property for in that format for about 18 years. And then they submitted an application to the Planning and Zoning Commission to revise the subdivision effectively try attempting to merge or all four lots into one parcel. This Planning and Zoning Commission approved that request in 1999, but no survey merging the parcels and no deeds from the Volpes to themselves merging the parcels were ever recorded on the Guilford land records. So when my client was uh, when the property was put up for sale, the records at the town clerk's office reflected a three lot subdivision in favor of the Volpes and a two lot subdivision with lot one being owned by the Volpes. Uh, the lot one of the Lally subdivision is now lot four of our proposed application. So my client purchased what he thought was a four lot subdivision and it wasn't until he submitted an application for a building permit that Mr. Kral, uh, when he went to uh, issue the permit, spoke with the assessor's office and they said, no, this was, this was merged into one parcel. There's nothing on the land records that reflects that. There's no, no survey with the town clerk that reflects that. And it wasn't until we scoured through the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission from 1999 uh, that we discovered that this revision was approved by this commission. So the question became, how do we address this problem? There was a conflict between what was on the land records and what the assessor was telling us was one lot. So we spoke with George and Chuck Andres and they said, well, we could take an appeal or file a suit in court or submit a subdivision application. So that's what we decided to do. We submitted this subdivision application effectively asking this commission to approve the four lots that it had approved, lots one, two, and three in 1980, revising it when in 1981, the corner of Flat Meadow Road and Sawmill Road was acquired by the Volpes and reapproving the lot one from the Lally subdivision, which it approved in 1991 when Mr. Lally approved, uh, applied for his subdivision. So what we're asking for is essentially for this commission to reapprove what its predecessor commissioners had approved in 1980 and 1991. We're not increasing the lot size. We're not increasing the number of lots. We're just looking to reconcile what's of record currently in the town clerk's office with regard to the, the approvals of this property with the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission when this lot was revised, uh, when the subdivision was uh, revised uh, in 1999. And we're also, we're also asking for, in lieu of, I know Mr. McGee had requested uh, in lieu of an open space dedication that a fee be submitted, but our feeling is that we walked into this situation if, anticipating that we we're buying four, pre, four approved lots because that's what's reflect, what is reflected on the land records. Uh, when in fact, according to the assessor, it was one lot. And then according to a review of the, uh, Planning and zoning minutes from 1999, it was uh, effectively revised to, to, to eliminate the subdivisions. Now, I don't know if, if they could have 
there were, there were, the problem was that there were two subdivisions that had been approved, the Lally subdivision to the south and the Volpe subdivision to the north. Uh, and I don't know, the minutes don't reflect which subdivisions were being revised, but the effect from the assessor's perspective was to merge the parcels into one lot, even though there was nothing on the land records to reflect that. So we're asking that the fee in lieu request from Mr. McGee be waived as we, <laughs> For the reasons that we've explained. So, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. The purpose of merging the lots back in what 1980 or 1999. The purpose of doing that would be to have all of this property dedicated as excess property versus building lots. Taxed as one lot. Yep. Taxes. So for the last. 22 years, it's been taxed as a single lot. Correct. And that file that that merger was never put into the land records. Correct. Speaking from my own experience, I know that whenever there's any sort of merger, what I try to do is, and what the assessor's office typically requires, is that the properties be conveyed out to a straw person. It's usually my assistant who then immediately conveys it back out to the title owners, reflecting that the intent of recording these deeds is to merge the title to the properties into a new dimension of the entire of the entire parcel. That wasn't done here. Let me, let me say two things, Phil. Could the, uh, the, uh, the proposed zoning, I mean, the proposed subdivision conforms to the current zoning code uh, the zoning code has not changed with respect to this particular area. So these lots still conform to the zoning regulations with regard to minimum lot size, et cetera. Uh, the other thing, the thing that we discovered actually when we went to the assessor's office is the assessor pulled out the uh, Mylar assessor's maps and you could literally see where the previous lot lines had been erased. Um, and Apparently, what happened was Mr. Volpe uh, took the letter of approval that the Planning and Zoning Commission issued and went to the assessor and said, okay, they approved this as one lot. And the assessor, in turn, then erased the uh, lot lines and it became one lot as far as the assessor was concerned. So, the way, so what should have happened is the assessor should have gone to town hall to verify that the lots had been merged. Right. Or the app, or the and the property owner, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Volpe, should have taken that letter of approval and you know taken it to the to the uh, town clerk and done something along the lines that Jeff just mentioned he does in similar circumstances, but that was never done. So for the for the new owner, was this lot purchased under the understanding that this was one single lot? No, no. no. You thought it was four and only only upon finding out from the assessor that it was being billed as a single lot was he aware well they no, came to he, the, they he came found to that the, he found that when he went to pull the building permits for what he thought was an approved four lot subdivision right that's correct so and needless to say there's a lot of gnashing of teeth at that time um and we couldn't figure out what was going on because you know we were looking to assign an address to the to the lot for which a new building permit was uh, to be taken out, and the assessor's record upon which the GIS database is built showed this as one lot. So it didn't it, obviously there was a discrepancy. Hey George, I have a question. Wouldn't a normal course of action back then to have been to create a new map and have it uh, signed by the people uh, you know the surveyor and then have it taken to the planning and zoning to be signed off and then recorded yes that that could have been done and it should have been done something along those should. lines so it's without that, rare that we have a it's it's extremely rare that there is a that we have a subdivision rescinded that's a pretty unusual step um so I don't know, from my perspective if, to make it a legal action just because they vote on it it doesn't necessarily happen until the actual re recordation of the new map is placed in the town records is at least that's my understanding of my 
right. typical one course. Of things, one of the things that Chuck Andrus explained to us, I think this is what he said, Jeff, is that um, they, they would not have needed any kind of planning and zoning approval actually in 1999 or whatever the date was. They could have just merged all the lots and they don't need plan. They wouldn't have needed planning and zoning to do that, in his opinion. They could have done a lot line revision and then made a new map. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Instead, they got a sub a subdivision revision approval, which essentially took a three lot subdivision and made it one. So it's very con very convoluted. And and just yeah. to add to that, you know, they didn't just extinguish the three lot subdivision that the Volpe's had approved in 1981. They also merged the lot from the Lally subdivision that was approved uh, in, in uh, 1991 into that in effectively brought it into the Volpe subdivision that it had been approved 10 years earlier. They, they effectively revised two, sub, two subdivisions. Yeah, it, it's, it's still, in my opinion, it's still an existing subdivision that it was just not taxed properly. I was about to say they got away with something for quite a while and it's from a tax standpoint but that's not hey, uh, just problem. just as a as a as a, que a question um the bold lines on flat meadow and the little um inlet um on the north side or, or on the uh east side of the uh the other two lots what what are the bold lines the, the the looks like a minefield. It's the soil texture. Uh, Mark Young, uh, Wild Associates. That uh, heavy dotted line uh, is a uh, delineation of the uh, soil types based on the uh, uh, US, the, the uh, NRCS uh, web soil survey. Uh, there are uh, designations. Uh, I believe it's. Uh, 60B and 73C, 73E, uh, which uh, just which describe the uh, soil types. Uh, yeah, all right. And that, that's just what that was like. And so the 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 uh, um, the the plans for the houses on these four lots um, are they are, are they current or yes. They Back. Yes, those um, were uh, laid out. Uh, new soil tests were done earlier this year, and uh, septic systems were designed, and, and that's what you see on here. Uh, lot three, of course, is the existing house. Uh, that has a uh, fairly modern septic system put in within the last 20 years. Okay. But uh, lots one, two, and four, uh, we're proposing new septic systems. Uh, and with uh, wells and so forth, uh, which are uh, completely compliant with uh, the current current uh, health code. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Jeff, in your opinion, so, is this a legal and existing subdivision as it's presented right now? Well, we we'd like to we'd like to think that there are two, but there is that 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 issue that the town's been taxing it as a single lot for the last twenty two years, and that was part of the discussion that Chuck. And George and I had as to, you know, right now, George is not in a position where he can issue a building permit because he's aware that the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission in 1999 uh, approved a revision to the subdivision, even though even though the map wasn't filed. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't that approval and that consolidation expire after a period of time, George? So we're never, if it wasn't filed, yes, that's, that's also true. So why are we here? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand that, that there's, maybe it's just because it was so unusual, but it seems to me if nothing was filed, then, there, then the statute of uh, the limitations has been. The oh. consolidation goes into the wind. The bottom the, line is that we're, that we're proceeding on this basis based on the advice of uh, Chuck Andrus, who's the council, council to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Basically, we want to clean this up, right, Jeff? The safest the idea uh, for all it, parties it, is to reapprove it. It, it seems to me. It, it, it seems to me. Who picks up the ball now? My client is picking up the ball. And Mr. Corsini went about as though these were lots that hadn't been tested yet. He spent time digging test pits, having perk tests done, placing yeah. units on it, and then he goes to pull the building permit, and he runs into 
George. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Technicalities. Well, um, so, note, to the, note, note to the tax collector that they might want to check the building records and note to the town that, you know, perhaps we put on the deed that, that these things are, you know, subject to filing by the approval. I mean, there should be a follow-up mechanism, both, you know, from the tax collector and also from the building department as to, you know, are these things, and I know it's a five, I think it's a five-year window, but still there should be some follow-up to make sure either things are done or things are officially rescinded. There's yeah. actually a 90 day window that this, this new map, assuming you approve it, will have to be filed in the land records within 90 days and you'll have to sign the Mylar fill prior to that. And then once that's done, the subdivision actually becomes legal. And who's, who's verifying that that gets done? The well, onus is always on the, on the, the applicant. Property owner. Yes. I, and if I it doesn't think get and if it doesn't get done within 90 days, then the Planning and Zoning Commission can vote to rescind the subdivision approval. That's true right. of any subdivision application, but that it, it's so rare that that happens um, that you know we don't have a lot of track record. And I can assure you, uh, based on based on conversations I had with Mr. Corsini, that that's not going to happen. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just I'm I'm thinking more about. <laughs> processes that we have in the department to make sure that we're not promoting no further well those are processes issues. that are established by Connecticut law not by us well I know but there should be some right. follow-up in the building department as to whether or not something is being done or not right yes so that's that's a subject for a later discussion um right are there any questions I mean I this is not the most straightforward one. Are there any questions from commissioners with respect to this application? I may have some questions. This is Jamie Phil. I may have some questions after we read the letters. Uh, do we have any letters? Um, yes, we do. Okay. Richard, you want to grab the first one? Hold on. Saw Pit, Three Mile Course, Sawmill Road from Kevin McGee. Get this. My bloody reader is out of well, I got you. I got you on the screen share if you want. Yeah, let me have Kevin's from this. There you go. We stop, we'll stop, we'll stop uh, sharing. Okay. How about yeah. that? You got that, Richard? I got it now. Okay. <laughs> As everybody can read along to the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission from Kevin McGee, environmental planner, re-subdivision property of FJ Corsini to second LLC, Sawmill Road. Guilford, Connecticut, 06437, Assessors Map 85, Lot 06301. The applicant is proposing to resubdivide 4.77 acres parcel into four lots. The applicant has completed the checklist of low impact development best management practices and is using several of the recommended practices. The stormwater management system consists of roof water discharging to rain gardens. The plans for the project have sedimentation and erosion control processes that are in compliance with 273-97B, subsection 6 of the zoning regulations. Inland wetlands are located off-site at the north side of the intersection of Flat Meadow and Sawmill Road. At the Inland Wetlands meeting on November 10th, 2021, the Inland Wetlands Commission favorably referred, referred favorably to the Planning and Zoning Commission, the subdivision shown on map titled Site Plan, property of Corsini Sawmill Road, Guilford, Connecticut, proposed, prepared by Waldo and Associates dated November 11th, 2021, with the condition that the soil and erosion controls measures be installed and protected off-site. <coughs> to protect off-site. Recommendations for conditions of approval. One, the Town of Guilford Zoning Enforcement Officer should be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures prior to site work at each lot. Soil stockpiles should be contained by self-fencing and or hay bales 
soil erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be maintained until vegetation is established or suitable material is installed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer. Two, to meet the open space requirements of section 272-41, one, excuse me, of the subdivision regulations, I recommend that be in lieu of land donation be made to the town of Guilford, land acquisition, Connecticut, General Statute Section 8-25. Apologize for my voice going out. Um, I'm George, I'm assuming that the uh, open space requirements of 272-41 were not in place when the subdivision was approved? Yeah, and I, I think that's correct. And there's no obvious uh, place where you would wanna have open space here. We had no fee in lieu of in those days. Okay, just double checking. Uh, who haven't we heard from? Scott, how about you? This is, uh, uh, hold on. Still, I believe, yeah, this, this is, is a, 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 a letter this is from in opposition. So, sure, why right. don't stop right. this? Um, so, those are the only uh, letters from town staff. Right. So, um, let's see if. Uh, uh, any other excuse me, uh, Dirk Goss with Waldo and Associates. Uh, I sent over the uh, health department uh, preliminary subdivision approval previously. Um, George, so, do you so, have so, that? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Do you have a Do you have a copy of it, Dirk? George, I, I could I could get one down here in about five minutes while you read the other letters. Yeah, I can I can go see it. Look in our file too. I'll, okay. I'll take a, I'll look for it. Okay. So uh, while we're waiting for that other letter from the health department, which probably I would suspect states, you know, the the septic requirements and adequacy or not, um, I'll open it up to any other question, Quest, we'll go with questions first and then statements in favor and statements against. Does anyone have any questions with respect to this uh, application? And again, uh, if your video is not on, I probably can't see you. Um, so feel free to speak up uh, and we can acknowledge you. Yes, uh, Peter Glasser, you have any yeah, questions? Peter, yeah, Peter Glaser, 49 Thirsty Hill Road. Uh, in Guilford, I'm, I'm uh, one of the letter writers um, in opposition, but I do have a question, just in, as a taxpayer in Guilford, uh, as far as, uh, you know, what is the, t the tax assessor and tax payment history there and whether there's an issue that, you know, might raise the question of tax fraud uh, uh, be because of the way uh, this was characterized and assessed. Uh, I, I hear you. I don't think that that falls to us. I mean, <laughs> I, I think you're, you're correct in your assessment that there were probably a number of years from the prior owner where they were under assessed with respect to this uh, property, but I don't think that falls to us as a land use commission. Um, I might bring it up with the tax assessor's office, but I don't think there's anything they're going to be able to do at this time against a prior owner. That's, that's just my take on it, and, but I hear what you're saying. Thank you. I do. I do have the. Uh, I do have a memo from uh, from Shirley Mickens. Um, I think this is what you're referring to. Yes, uh, sir. This is. Uh, I'll I'll read it. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, this is to Frank, Dirk, and Mark um, from Shirley Mickens. I followed up with Sonia on the lots. The health department is approving the four lot subdivision, and additional testing can be done at the time of construction. I would like to note that since this subdivision was approved before 2007, it was acceptable to approve lots that had potentially suitable soils. Potentially suitable soils have at least two feet of naturally occurring soil above ledge rock. I believe we discussed this on site during soil testing. Going forward, subdivision approvals must have a minimum of 18 inches of naturally occurring soil above maximum groundwater and four feet above ledge rock per 2018 technical standards, page 34 and 35. Getting a little ahead of the project, our inspectors will require a fill inspection in addition to the usual stakeout, scarification, and final due to the amount of select fill necessary. We will check the placement of fill prior to the system 
install and confirm four feet to ledge. That's what you were referring to, I, I think, Dirk. Yes, sir. That's the one. Thank you, <laughs> George. Appreciate you finding that. Um, are there any other questions with respect to this application from the public? Well, I I, I, I would just say, you know, in in reaction to you know Peter's question, which I I also have a question about <clears throat> um, if there is any you know any recourse relative to taxes um, does Mr. Corsini own the entire 4.77 acres now? Uh, yes. Ms. Jeffrey Beatty uh, for the applicant yes he purchased it in uh, we closed in September of this year. Okay. So uh, th there is there, I mean, no one here probably can answer this and it probably will just, you know, become a, you know, a course of history. But, uh, you know, if the prior owners were not, maybe not intentionally, but avoiding taxes, that's something to look, be looked into. And I, I just think it should be an, an issue, an issue for this application. But that's all I'm saying. I don't, I don't think we can hold the the current applicant up with respect to the actions of a prior owner. I mean, if the town wanted to go back after the prior owner, that would be up to the town to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just my feeling on it. I mean, yeah, I I get you. I mean, if the if the current owner bought it in good faith, but you know. You know, I'm saying if, if there was not a good title search done on this whole thing and this Mr. Corsini bought it. There, there was a good, the, that, that's exactly the problem, Mr. Cosgrove, that, that there was a title search done and the records on file. Of, 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 the, of the town were, it, were, were not correct. The, the records on the land records reflect a subdivision right. that had been right. approved with no changes to it. Right, right. <laughs> so, so nothing in the deed indicated that they had been consolidated. Right, exactly. So that's, I mean, your, your land, your title searches are based on deed. Exactly. Right. Thank you. Uh, Peter, yes? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, not a lawyer, but just the, the fact that um, uh, Mr. Volpe benefited from the taxation as if it were a single lot for all those years I'm wondering if that uh, by de, de facto establishes this as a single lot rather than an existing subdivision. I, I think that's a, uh, that's a that's a tough connection to make in my mind, but. Um, I'd be able to add to this. Um, if you could, sorry, if you could state your name and address for the record. Absolutely. Um, I'm Michael Zaransky at 559 Sawmill Road. I own the property and live in the property uh, most adjacent to this uh, construction. Um, I think the tax question is an interesting one, um, but uh, my, my main concern or question would be if we look at uh, lot four, uh, the old Lely lot, and I'm, I'm actually living in the old Lely house, um, so I'm familiar with the lot. And um, I'm looking at the setback, I think is a setback for this um, zoning area of 20 feet. Is that what's reflected on the plan? Seems to suggest that on the plan, I have it up on my screen in front of me. Um, and it looks, I mean, the, the plan seems to be a little shoehorned into the lot. So I'm a little concerned that uh, as, I, as I look at the property, as it's laid out on the lot, it does overlap that setback by a little bit. Um, not personally overly concerned with it, but I think it's worth noting. Right. Yeah. The, the, the actual location would, and the, the compliance with zoning code would fall to the building official and zoning enforcement. Okay. Uh, but just, just point, just, you know, yep. just, just bringing some things up that, that may be of interest. Uh, the second point is um, obviously that if you look in the lower right hand corner of the plot plan, you'll see a Existing well with a large uh, circumference or uh, George, can you put the map it. back up? Yeah, um, I, I could do it if you want, George. Yeah, just it's, let me let me 
you may want to zoom on on zoom zoom in on lot four there. Go ahead, Dirk. Is and, and sorry to, to say this again. Is this is there a question or is this comment and support or against? This would be a comment. Okay. Then, then uh, what I'd I, ask what, well, what I'd ask what I'd ask you to do is question. hold on until we're done with questions, and then we'll give you the floor the floor for comments if that's okay. Yeah, I mean that that would be just fine. I mean there are some questions, but we can address it later as well. Um, just about how the the there's it, it it seems to suggest that the existing uh, uh, septic system, the perimeter of which encroaches on the seventy five feet, and my question would be, um, you know, mm -hmm. is that what everybody else sees? Is that am I seeing that um, clearly? So uh, we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, I'm just going to throw it out to see if there are any questions, and then we'll come back to comments and forward support and allow the applicant to answer those. Are there any other questions from the audience <laughs> with respect to this application? And I would reiterate questions. Okay. This is uh, oh. Aaron Alvey with 329 Three Mile Course. Um, yeah. So someone previously brought up um, kind of the precedent that's been set for the history of this parcel in terms of it being taxed as one lot um, instead of four lots. I, I, that previous person to me kind of, you know, from a fresh perspective kind of brought up a, a good point that, you know, since there is discrepancy within the written documentation on this parcel that since it's been treated as a single lot for the past two plus decades, that, you know, there is a precedent there for it being one lot. And I think that's just something worth considering or thinking more about collectively um, on the commission as you're uh, thinking about approval. Well, um, again, as, as attorney Beta pointed out, um, when the consolidation um, was proposed by the applicant 20 plus years ago, uh, when that land record was not filed, it officially expired. So we have a four lot subdivision before us now. Um, and I think, right, and I, I, I understand the sentiments that people um, are concerned about a subdivision going in, um, but I, uh, in my mind, the argument that this is a single lot. And again, you can appeal this to superior court. Um, in my mind, that's not what we're dealing with. I mean, the tax issues aside, you know, what we're trying to do is, is look at what we have in front of us. Um, so this is Jamie, just to that point, there, there's a lot of steps in this process. So attorney Beattie, if you could just help me out here. It went from one lot to three lots, to four lots, to four lots. But I, I'm confused here. Where is the, the, the additional, there was like a consolidation of subdivisions that happened with the property on the east. Can you, can you help me in that time schedule I, again? I'll do my best. So on, on the application that's before the commission tonight, lots one, two, and three were acquired by the Volpes in the early 1960s, 1963. Then in 1980, they applied for a subdivision of, the, of that property into three lots. That application was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission and they filed a subdivision map in September of 1980. At that time, if you look at, on the subdivision map, you see the, uh, the stone wall uh, along the corner of, uh, of lots, uh, along bisecting lot one and lot two. That land was based effectively the property line of the Volpe property. In 1981, the town sold along the corner of Flat Meadow Road and Sawmill Road to the Volpe's. And then they came back to the Planning and Zoning Commission and revised the subdivision to incorporate that portion that they got, that triangular piece, into lots one and two. And they filed a revised subdivision map on the land record or in the town clerk's office uh, reflecting that. In 1991, Mr. Lally, who, owns, who owned the land that includes what's now lot four on what you have before you tonight, 
divided his property into two lots. And he filed that subdiv and that application was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. And he filed that subdivision map with the town clerk's office as well. He then conveyed what was lot one of the Lally Park subdivision to the Volpe's, which is now lot four of what you have here tonight. The Volpe's then came back to the Planning and Zoning Commission in 1999 and requested a revision of the subdivision. I don't know what the application looked like because I didn't, I haven't gone through the Planning and Zoning okay. Commission archives, but the Planning and Zoning Commission approved that request to revise the subdivision, effectively making it all four lots, one lot. Okay, thank you. That was my confusion, whether that last transaction happened before or after, but I think I've got it now. Thank you. I have and a then, question for George. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm done. George, uh, you, I think you mentioned early on that this does meet the requirements for that zone as far as uh, being a subdivision in general. Is that correct? Right. And I think the if this were being presented to us as a subdivision on uh, uh, a 4.7 acre parcel or whatever it is, and there had been none of this previous history, you would we would still recommend that you approve it because it conforms to all the current uh, codes. Right. So I think the other stuff is just sort of a historical yes. uh, accounting, but the reality is it's a four lot subdivision that Mr. Corsini didn't know he had to go through. Yes, that's correct. Phil, I do have some questions about the soil types. Can I ask those now or you want me to? Sure, no, this is when we're asking questions. Great, uh, thanks. I, I guess it's for um, Waldo and Associates. Uh, mm -hmm. The sort of the areas of disturbance, I guess, uh, for these proposed homes, what is the soil type and how would you rate sort of the drainage capacity or the infiltration of stormwater? Okay, the uh, soil type is labeled the uh, Charlton Chatfield Complex, uh, zero to 15% slopes, uh, very rocky. Um, it's a generally, uh, you know, moderately sandy uh, soil, uh, it tends to be shallow to bedrock. Um, you know, drainage is uh, is moderate, and it, you know it's a it's a well drained soil. Uh, put that way, um, you know, as far as uh, uh, you know, rainwater infiltration and so forth, it's uh, uh, in the middle of the road. Okay, uh, thank you. There, we don't anticipate any problems. Uh, like I say, uh, soil test indicated a sufficient depth for leaching fields, and. Uh, uh, we're specifying rain gardens for the uh, uh, roof runoff, and uh, you know they they're uh, it has that they have similar infiltration requirements to uh, the septic system, so we don't anticipate any problems. Okay. Uh, in addition to that question, is there an adjacent water body to the site? Um, the <laughs> the nearest water, water body would be uh, Thirsty Lake, which is several hundred feet to the east. Um, there is, is a uh, very small stream uh, to the northwest, which would be the uh, the nearest wetland that Kevin mentioned. It's more than 200 feet uh, from the property um, across the street. Uh, so it's uh, you know it, there will, there won't be any effect to that. Thank you. And last question: How does the site drain? How what is what is the grading like? Where where is the water? Okay. There, uh, you know, if you look look carefully, we have uh, uh, two two foot contours um, on the uh, on the property. Those are based on a field survey. Uh, so basically, it's kind of like a, a shoulder. Uh, the high point is this is that uh, uh, oval oh, sort of oval area uh, circle to the south, and it drains primarily to the north and uh, off to the slightly off to the Northeast and the uh, Northwest. Uh, the houses will be sited um, you know, in a kind of central location on lots one and two. Uh, and so uh, again, they drain primarily to the North. Um, and while lot four, it will be on the, uh, on the Westerly side of the slope, which will drain uh, to, to, to the West. And the water bodies are to, it's 700 feet to the east. 
Jamie, I, I can help you with that. Hold on one okay. second. Thank you. So uh, here's Sawmill Road. Here's Flat Meadow. I believe this is Thirsty, mm -hmm. Thirsty Lake. Pond. Is it Thirsty Lake? Lake. So that and so here's our existing home. And I, if I'm doing this right, it's basically kind of this area, including this triangle, which is the piece that was acquired from the town. Correct. That's very helpful. Thank you, Phil. Sure. We try to be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions either from um, the public commissioners? Um, in, that, in the absence of questions, uh, we'll move to comments. Would anybody like to speak in favor of this application? And Are you uh, going to read the letters? Um, well, I was going to actually ask if people are here to read their own letters that they're welcome to read them or we can have commissioners read them into the record, whatever people prefer. I, I think at least two, two of us are here to read letters. Okay. Um, uh, it, uh, is Glenn Fletcher and Dorothy Velosen here? Yes, we are here, but would just as soon the record be read into the, into the records, if you would, the letter. Jamie, you want to grab this letter from? Uh, sure thing, Phil. I have it up. Dorothy, yep. that'd be great. Thank you. Gwen Fletcher and Dorothy Velosen, 179 Flat Meadow Road, Guilford, Connecticut, 06437, dated December 12th, 2021. Town of Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, 50 Boston Street, Guilford, Connecticut, 06437 regarding 591 Sawmill Road, parcel number 08506301, application for re-subdivision. Dear commissioners, we are abutting neighbors at 179 Flat Meadow Road to the east of the subject parcel. As such, our property will be impacted by the proposed development. Our concerns for this application are as follows. The installation of three new wells within 600 feet of our existing well may have an impact on the water supply and quality of water to our well. We have commissioned Mosman Well Works to perform testing on our well to provide us with base data. We will share this data with the town and the developer upon receipt of the report. Once construction on the development is complete, we will retest our well to determine if there has been any reduction in the flow or quality of the water. Should there be any reduction in either flow or quality, we expect the developer to bear all costs involved in restoring the well on our property to its original state, which may include re-drilling to a lower depth. Additionally, we expect the developer to reimburse us for the costs of both tests. Uh, number two. There exists a row of healthy hemlock trees on the border of our two properties, which we planted with permission from the utility company to provide a vegetative privacy screen to the west. These trees are to be protected and preserved during construction, and if damaged, will be replaced at the developer's expense with trees of a similar species and size. Finally, the drawings indicate the site will need to be regraded to provide adequate depth for the new leaching fields in lots one and two. We are concerned that additional groundwater runoff will be directed toward our property as a result of these changes. We would like assurances that measures will be taken to prevent any groundwater from leaving the properties as a result of the development and what those measures will be respectfully submitted, Gwen Fletcher and Dorothy Velosen. Uh, I, I do appreciate your concerns. Um, we, I'll just quickly jump to the, the, the first one. I, I guess you're, you're wise to have your water tested. Um, and if in fact that, that quality or flow is diminished, um, my suspect, I suspect, and Attorney Beatty will probably be able to help me on this. Um, it would be upon you and your company to establish that that diminishment was the direct result of the development. Um, you know, I, I, you can't really impose that upon a planning and zoning commission 
to ensure. Um, I, I don't know about the trees, um, but again, if they're on the property of the developer, um, I don't think you can demand that they remain in place. But again, um, I'll, I'll let commissioners speak to that as well as George and Attorney Beatty. Uh, and with respect to the water runoff, um, the building engineer and the zoning enforcement officer uh, usually have conditions in place with respect to development for silt fencing uh, to prevent the, the leaving of materials um, from a property. Bill, you can probably comment also with respect to how that is typically handled. Yeah, um, I think that they're one, I think their concern is that there's just going to be continuous overland water flow, not groundwater overflow. And uh, I thought from what uh, I heard before that most of the drainage was to the north and the west, if I heard him correctly. So I don't think that that's going to be a big issue for them being that they're to the east. And as you said, a, uh, erosion and sedimentation controls are always in place and are maintained through vigilance of the developer and through observation from the zoning enforcement and wetlands. Officer. And obviously if that is, a, is the case, we would encourage you to bring any type of flow on your property to the attention of zoning enforcement and the building engineer. Uh, and Mr. John, the, a clarification. Go ahead. A clarification on the trees, they are not on the, uh, they are on our property. Okay, then, then obviously, <laughs> obviously anything on your property should not be disturbed, especially trees. That makes sense. Uh, Phil, this is Jamie. Uh, th this last point raises a question for me. Um, if the engineers could just speak to uh, regrading. Um, I, I lost the discussion with in Sonia's letter about the depth to suitable soils when this was originally subdivided versus the depth to suitable soils currently. Can someone please clarify that? Well, the uh, uh, Mark Young uh, Waldo Associates, uh, the uh, soils haven't changed. Uh, it's just that the uh, standards have changed a little bit. Um, the, uh, however, the standards for uh, septic systems uh, have not changed. Uh, that said, we did find uh, shallow bedrock in many areas, and this will require the placement of fill to provide adequate separation from the leaching system to uh, ledge rock. Uh, the final grading will be uh, the critical uh, issue in this uh, instance to uh, prevent any overland flow of water, uh, of surface runoff onto the adjoining property. Uh, when we do the final um, septic system plans, there will be details on there uh, uh, clarifying the surface grading um, so that the uh, contractor will be aware uh, of that issue and uh, will prepare the, uh, the final grading and stabilization of the uh, area so that there will be no, uh, uh, no impact on the adjoining properties. And just to follow up, this is Scott, you're, you're going to do all that based off of the current code and not based off the 2007 code? Oh, no, absolutely. Everything, everything will be current. Um, all three, uh, lots one, two, and four, will have individual uh, subsurface sewage disposal system designs uh, at, uh, at, at, at greater detail than you see here on the site development plan. Uh, they'll be prepared by a, a, a professional engineer uh, and uh, uh, reviewed and, and, and approved by the health department. So I just want, thank all, you. all those I just issues to... will be uh, detailed, uh, you know, much better on those uh, plan, upcoming plans. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that because yeah. Sonia, uh, the uh, health commissioner, uh, health director's letter made it seem a little confusing. It seemed like she was approving it based off uh, okay. old information, that's, but she's that's not really the case. Uh, again, they get another shot at us uh, at, at each lot individually. Right. When we prepare the detail plans. Uh, yeah. Phil? Yes, Richard. 
Richard Wallace for gentlemen from Waldo. Are there going to be four, were there four wells being sunk in this or is this going to be, is this going to be city, these are going to be wells or Connecticut water? Oh, oh, we're, we're proposing individual wells. So three, right? There'll be three, three new wells which uh, meet the uh, separating distances uh, specified in the health code. Okay. Uh, Peter, would you like to read your letter? Uh, uh, can I ask another question, Mr. Johnson? Certainly. Before Peter right, gets in. Um, what, what is the depth requirement uh, as far as when you, uh, before you hit bedrock, what's the, re the current requirement for that? Um, as far as uh, septic systems, um, yeah. yes, okay. There has to be at least two feet of native soil for the area to be uh, considered suitable for a leaching system. Then you have to um, place fill to provide a minimum of four feet uh, vertical separating distance between the ledge rock and the bottom of the leaching system. So there will be uh, fill placed on these uh, on these septic systems. Am I right that the the figures at the bottom right of the plan indicate the depth of the tests? Those the depths are uh, indicated in the uh, lower left corner. It has uh, the uh, soil logs. It, they all know uh, uh, redox, water, uh, ledge, roots, respective layer. All the, all, all the factors which we consider when we're uh, laying out the septic system. The, the plans, um, and I'm, I'm getting my set of plans now because I'm having a hard time re, uh, referring to them, but it seems to me that where the leaching fields are set up now at the lot closest to Flat Meadow, mm -hmm. that uh, there were several tests and most of those tests, if I'm reading the, the thing right, didn't didn't come up with enough soil to put a uh, system in. Well, the, 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 the test in the vicinity of the proposed leaching system had more than 24 inches of soil. So they're considered suitable. It's only 24? Yes. We have to place fill to provide the 48 inches that the code requires to, uh, below the uh, leaching field to, to, to bedrock. Thank, thank you, Dorothy. Do you mind if we go to Peter at this point? Well, just one one question. Uh, there was a uh, other than this. There was mention of uh, being able to connect to uh, um, the public water system. Was that considered? And if it was, why was it rejected? Uh, we did consider that, but the the distance involved uh, make it uh, not economical. Uh, where where does the where does the public water come in? What's the nearest point? Am I right? Uh, it's I believe it's down by the corner of Mirror Lane. Okay. Or, or over on uh, Long Hill Road. Uh, yeah, it's, it's both, I'm sure. Yes. Um, the, the reason for rejecting that as a possibility would be? Not economical. Mm -hmm. Just, okay. Just raising the potential question: If uh, if our well is impacted and a new well needs to be redrilled, um, there's a cost there, which uh, would be borne by your organization. Well, I I think you'd have to establish that your well was compromised as a result of this activity. Yeah. Um, and you can, uh, you can, it, it is. You just well, that that would be your opinion right now, and probably would be your opinion at the time, but those things would have to be established and not just declared. So um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna move on to Peter thank Glazer. You. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so this is a letter from uh, December 13th to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission regarding the 591 Sawmill Road parcel. Um, so dear commissioners, we are abutting neighbors at 49 Thirsty Hill Road, also known as 49 Flat Metal Road. Uh, to the east of the subject parcel. And uh, we have the following concerns. Uh, one is uh, the stormwater uh, runoff and flooding risks. Um, uh, 
I didn't originally understand how this subdivision was happening. I thought it was three and adding a fourth, but in any case, with the addition of the fourth lot, especially lot number four, where existing lawn and vegetation will be cleared and replaced by structures, <clears throat> I'm concerned that this leads to a high risk of problems with water, water runoff. This may be exacerbated by a grading and blasting of ledge because that, that section is uh, clearly uh, full of ledge and rock outcroppings. As our property is directly downhill from this area, and actually this hill is, has a steep slope, we are concerned that additional groundwater runoff will be directed toward our property due to these changes. And we'd like assurances that measures will be taken to prevent groundwater from leaving the properties as a result of these developments. Second concern is the risk of blast, blasting because of that ledge. Uh, the properties, as I noted, set on a substantial amount of ledge and rock outcroppings. We're concerned about the need for blasting and the potential impact of blasting damage on our house or foundation. Uh, should there be any damage from blasting, this is uh, similar to the prior uh, person's concern, we would expect developer to bear the cost of restoring the property to the original state. I understand your comments that we would need to establish that. In this regard, I want to point out that in 2011, we proposed to the commission to install a swimming pool in the western part of our property near to the 591 sawmill uh, property border. It was contested and blocked by the prior owner of the 591 property, Mr. Volpe, on the grounds of risk of blasting causing potential damage to his property. He argued convincingly about the risks of blasting and proximity to existing structures. Um, and I would say the same concerns pertain here. Another point that was not brought up previously is the issue of access and right of way for Eversource and other utilities. The electric power lines and communications lines, cable and telephone run along the right of way easement on the Eastern boundary of the parcel. Over the past 30 years, there have been numerous instances where bucket trucks have been brought in during outages to affect repairs to the power lines due to uh, damage uh, to the lines and to, to trees along uh, that border. The truck access is from Flat Meadow Road along a path indicated on the site plan that's called Oldwood Road. I don't know if you can pull up that uh, the site plan that was uh, put up um, uh, or perhaps I could share or... Um, um, do I have Dirk, do you want Dirk, to, you can put your you, you can share Dirk or or uh, Mark? Did <clears throat> you talk about the wood road? Yeah. Okay, we're sure with Rick. Yeah. I don't have the ability to share, so um, well I, I'm pointing out the approximate location of the wood road. But no, we don't know sharing your screen. You need to share your Nobody's screen. sharing a screen. Sharing now. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. So basically, there's there's um, it's, a little low. Uh, it's very hard to see, but there's there's a yeah uh, there there's a little bit of it looks like a path, the double dotted lines coming off a of flat meadow, heading a little bit um, to the uh, uh, southeast. Yeah, that's it. So that actually is is a cleared. Uh, it's it's a, a grassy path, but it's wide enough for trucks. That's where bucket trucks have come through because the the um, the utilities run along uh, the the border there. You can see uh, barely see where the, the telephone poles are. There's no other access uh, to those. So um, uh, and you know we've had so many storms from you know. Uh, superstorm Sandy to other hurricanes to ice storms, and and it's a spur line uh, Eversource uh, circuit um, that um, serves uh, uh, our property, the Critchie property, and actually this the Volpe property, which is you know, the existing house in Lot Three, uh, <clears throat> and actually the the power lines to Volpe are underground from the pole that sits uh, near our house. Um, but uh, that requires repair, access for repairs. So I, I, I would like to, I know I'm a little bit off script, but um, you know, I, I just want to bring to attention that this or similar access is essential to maintain 
uh, electric utility and other services to the uh, four properties that uh, uh, border here um, uh, that are all served on the same spur line circuit. It's circuit number 132429F2 by Eversource. Um, so Peter, there, there are existing easements, correct? I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what the rules are. Um, I believe that, you know, the utility companies must have some uh, right of way, but, but I'm just making note that uh, that is the only way, physical way they can get in I, by that, that existing path. George, the, 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 the easement and access would be maintained. Is that correct? If, if I could just address that. Sorry, no, no. go ahead. Uh, Jeff Beatty again for uh, Selvin Griffith and Beatty. In reviewing the land records, there was no utility easement over the Wood Road uh, to access those over this property. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I, my suspicion is that it was the path of least resistance over a cleared area to get to service those utilities. I in taking a quick. Uh, look at the deeds into the Glazer property and the Creechy property, I didn't see it that they were conveyed together with any easement over the Volpe property that would uh, allow Eversource, that, that Ever, Eversource would have the, be able to cover, to cross the, the Old Wood Road as of right to service those properties. So, I, so I, what, what, what is your um, solution for when the, power, when the power goes down? The, the the utility poles are on the neighbor's property, um, and I would I, I would say that Eversource would have to figure out a way to get in there to service those those lines when they went down. But they don't have a they don't have a right of way over lots one and two. Okay. So so just to be clear, uh, the the existing building, the Volpe House, is served by the 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 third pole that actually borders between our pro it's I guess it sits maybe a, a couple of feet on our property but it's it's yeah it's right about where the cursor is the uh, that pole the Volpe electric utility comes off of that pole so I, I would say that the people living in that house are going to want uh, you know um, Eversource to have access to because when these lines go down, it's on one transformer and all the houses go out. So uh, apart from whether this is approved or not, I think the developer and owner of this property needs to be aware that this is a, a risk. And if access is cut off, there's gonna be problems. Um, uh, help me if I'm wrong here, George, I don't believe we have the right to impose an easement. For a utility, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, well, um, we might have to. If, if you could note that we'd like to look into that if this gets continued, okay? Um, I mean, how is there a way for me to pursue that? I, I have no idea what to do, uh, but you know, I just know that that's <clears> going to be a problem in the future for the people that live there, including the new homeowners if this gets approved. Uh, Phil? Yes. My experience is that where the pole sits is where the uh, access point would come from. So I don't think that, at least in my experience, that they would be able to enforce a, a easement of convenience from the past to something that is actually legal now. It's just a, It was just a path that they took because it mm -hmm. was there. So oh, my, my, my suggestion, Peter, would probably be um, to seek the advice of a land use attorney with respect to this issue and the utility access, because um, uh, <laughs> we're beyond the scope of, of my knowledge. And obviously, um, we want you to get the best advice possible. Uh, Phil, this is Jamie. I, I have a follow-up question for George. Is this, will we, if this moves forward, is there an opportunity for the commission to see a detailed site plan review for each 
parcel, which would include utilities, grading, blasting? No. Or is this it? I mean, opportunity, yes, but there's no we don't there's no requirement that the commission approve it, the individual site development plans for individual lots. Oh. Thank you. George, have we ever imposed a bond uh, upon a developer with respect to potential damage as a result of, I don't even know if there's going to be blasting or not. Have we ever imposed a, a bond to uh, ensure that any damage that has resulted from blasting is addressed? No, it's not something that's under our jurisdiction there is an elaborate permitting process for, for blasting administered by the fire department. And they, if there are blasting permits uh, sought, they require uh, testing uh, of uh, adjacent properties. There's a whole protocol associated with that in order to uh, deal with potential claims of damage should the adjacent property owners have damage. Uh, but that's, that's not under the jurisdiction of the Planning and Zoning Commission. That's, done, that's under the jurisdiction of the fire department. And any blasting permits have to be obtained from them. Okay. I think Mr. Glazer, um, Peter Glazer, yes, referenced the fact that Mr. Volpe objected to blasting. <laughs> the, the irony is not lost. And, on and him. that was and that was approved. The, his objection was approved. Yeah, how was that? Yeah. So well, he he no, blocked our ability to put a swimming pool in. I, you know, I, I wish I could speak to the prior planning and zoning commission, but obviously we, you know. Well, again, that and also when a, when when that wasn't one does something it. the planning and zoning commission dealt with, if that if it was a blasting permit that was mm -hmm. denied, that would have been again the fire department, not planning and zoning. Got it. So also, may I Bill, may Bill, I ask? May I ask the representatives of the developer, is blasting planned? My understanding is that the uh, they're trying, if there is any, they're not planning on, uh, and I'll let Mr. Corsini speak to this, but he's not planning on building uh, full basements in any of the proposed houses that he's going to build. I'd also, uh, and so he's, he's trying to limit any blasting to the extent he can. Uh, the, the other thing that I would point out is lot three has an existing house on it. And so if there is any blasting, he's he's going to at risk of not damaging his own house that's there, not just yours. Uh, yes, uh, I know. So I, I my the reason I say that is because my expectation is that Mr. Corsini will do the best he can to uh, reduce the risk of damaging his own property, which is closer to any blasting site that, uh, which is in all likelihood closer to any blasting than than the neighboring properties. So there might be blasting. So, and also when you do blasting and you fall within certain guidelines that George mentioned, you have to put a seismograph over on the uh, other property and record the wavelengths both from uh, vertically and horizontally to determine if you've passed the threshold, which is determined by the, the blasting uh, rules and regulations. I, I never asked them what they were, but I know that you have to put a device on the ground that measures the energy of the waves that come to the, to the structure. And if they're below a certain threshold, then you're clear. And if they're above, then you may have to mitigate damage if there is any. Right. Um, Peter, if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask if uh, Todd and Louise Gould are here. Uh, there is a letter from uh, Todd and Louise Gould. Scott, do you want to read that into the record? Do you want me to pull it up? Yes. There you go. Hold on here. Incoming. Sorry. I got it. Okay. Um, 
uh, dated December 13th, the town of Guilford Planning and Zoning, RE, Jake Orsini, 2LLC application. Dear Planning and Zoning Commission, we're immediate neighbors to the proposed subdivision at 185 Flat Meadow Road on the north side, directly across from Lot 1. We have several concerns or comments we would like to share. Our existing well is of unknown depth, located in the very front of our property, quite close to Flat Meadow Road. That's quite close to lot one. We had, we had to replace our well pump three years ago due to the pump working extra hard when our water supply was limited. There's quite a lot of ledge present, present in the proposed subdivision. The 19 different test pits average depth for hitting ledge is only 34.2 inches and less than one third of those test pits were even above 35 inches. It appears considerable soils will need to be brought in to make the septic systems legal. How does that impact runoff? Our basements planned for uh, the 13 homes. Our concern here would be the extensive blasting needed to deal with considerable ledge and how that might structurally impact the many homes surrounding the proposed subdivision. Uh, we would very much like to know if the applicant, instead of drilling two new, three new wells, has considered CT Water Company's water line that comes south on Mirror Lane, ending just before it intersects with Flat Meadow Road. This would certainly alleviate having to drill wells of unknown depths and costs and perhaps deal with neighboring problems. <clears throat> if the intent is to sell four spec homes as a lifelong full-time realtor, I, Todd Gould, know the majority of buyers would prefer city water over wells and are willing to pay a premium for such. We also believe that several immediate neighbors, ourselves included, will welcome the opportunity to hook up to a water main and I would expect the economy of scale would help with the applicant's costs. Sincerely, Todd and Louise Gould. Thank you for your letter. Uh, the Creechies here, Mark and Kathleen. Um, let's see who we have not heard from. Bill Freeman, would you be kind enough to read in the letter from Mark and Kathleen Creechie? I believe I pronounced that right, but if I didn't, forgive me. December 14, 2021, Town of Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission, 15 Bo 50 Boston Street, Guilford, Connecticut, 06437. Regarding 591 Sawmill Road, parcel 08506301, application for resubdivision. Dear commissioners, we are our abutting neighbors at 69 Thirsty Hill Road, AKA 69 Flat Meadow Road, to the east of the subject parcel, as such, our property will be impacted by the proposed development. Our concerns for this application are as follows. Number one, an increase in stormwater runoff from both construction and proposed development uphill of the property will increase risks of flooding and jeopardize Thirsty Lakes water quality. With, possible, with the possible addition of a fourth lot, currently existing forest lawn and vegetation will be cleared and replaced with impervious surface, leading to significant risk of problems with water runoff. This may be exacerbated by grading and blasting of ledge. As our property is directly downhill from this area and, th and this hill has a steep slope, in quotes, we are concerned that additional groundwater runoff will be directed toward our property as well as Thirsty Lake due to these changes. We would like assurances that extensive measures, uh, I gotta find myself here. Extensive measures will be taken to prevent any groundwater from leaving the property as a result of the development and what those measures will be. Of final note, the clearing of existing forestry and natural landscape will greatly disrupt the natural habitat and wildlife crossing within the surrounding ecosystem. With the recent developments on Long Hill Road, there have been increased wildlife encounters, especially coyotes, fox, black bear, <clears throat> and fisher cats. May our little Della Dachshund rest in peace. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Oops, sorry. Risk of blasting due to extensive ledge. These properties, especially lot four, sit on substantial amounts of ledge and rock, out, rock outcroppings. We are concerned about the need for blasting and the potential impact of blasting on damage to our house and foundation. Should there be any damage from blasting, we expect the developer to bear all costs involved in restoring the property to the original state. In this regard, in 2011, the neighboring property at 49 Thursday Hill Road proposed to the commission to install a swimming pool in the western property part of their property near 591 sawmill property 
It was contested and blocked by the prior owner of 591 property, Mr. Volpe, on the grounds of the risk of blasting caused potential damage to his property. Mr. Vol Mr. Volpe argued convincingly about the risk of blasting in proximity to the existing structure. The same concerns pertain here. Number three, access and right of way for, of Eversource and other utilities, electric power lines, and communication lines, cables, and their and telephone, in quotes, run along a right of way uh, slash easement on the eastern boundary of the parcel. Over the past 22 years, there have been numerous instances of bucket trucks that have been brought in during an outage to effect repairs of the power lines to damage from storms. Truck access from Flat Meadow Road along the path indicated Old Wood Road on the site plan submitted to the commission. This is similar, this is or a similar access is essential to main services to the Fletcher, Glaser, and Kuchichi properties, as well as the existing Volpe house on the site, all four of which are served by the same spur line circuit, which is designated as circuit 132, 490, 429, F2 by Eversource because it is not along a road. Preservation of access to this is a critical consideration. We would like assurances in me that measures will be taken to provide for continued re utility repair truck access to the power lines. Number four, impact on existing wells. The installation of three new wells in close proximity to our existing well may have an impact on the water supply and quality of our water well, of water to our well. This concern is also noted by Fletcher letter to the commission dated December 12, 2021. Should there be any reduction in quality, either flow or quality, we expect the developer for all costs involved in restoring the well on our property to its original state, which may include redrilling, redrilling to a lower depth. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Mark and Kathleen Kerchichi. Uh, keep going, see what we got. Uh, here's a, is this so again, that's, no, that's, that's for next, uh, next item. Okay. Yeah, um, I think that's it. So we're, we're done with the letters. Um, would anyone else like to speak in favor of this application? I, I have a letter, uh, Dirk Goss, Waldo and Associates, that I'd like to read. Certainly. Um, mm -hmm. Can I, can I try to share? You can try. <laughs> uh, let me let me stop my share, okay. and then you go. All right. <laughs> try here. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just read it, okay? That'd be great. All right. Um, this is to uh, George Paul from uh, Robert E. Sonics and Professional Engineer, Waldo Associates. Dear Mr. Kroll, we have reviewed the proposed site development plan for 591 Sawmill Road with respect to issues raised by neighbors in letters dated from December 12th through December 14th. Our responses to these issues are as follows. Wells. The septic system is shown on the proposed site development plan, dated, revi dated revised December 7, 2021, comply with the 75 foot well separation distance required by the State of Connecticut Public Health Code. The separation distance has proven over many years to be effective in minimizing the risk of contamination of other wells and aquifer depletion. Stormwater runoff. Best practice erosion control measures will be employed during construction. Appropriate stormwater management measures are proposed. The overall grade along the property line slopes to the north. Regrading for septic systems will not change this condition significantly. The septic systems shown are conceptual, are intended to comply with the Guilford subdivision regulations. Septic, de septic designs will, will be reviewed and approved by the Guilford Health Department during the engineered septic system phase of the project in connection with home construction. Minimizing potential surface runoff 
and compliance separating distances to property lines will be maintained. Lasting, the proposed houses will be designed with crawl spaces rather than full basements to minimize blasting. Any blasting, such as for utilities and drainage lines, will be conducted according to the latest safety protocols. Very truly yours, Robert E. Sonics, and professional engineer. Thank you. Uh, are there any other letters or would anyone like to let's see, speak in favor of this application? Uh, would anyone like to speak against this application? Again, I would say if I... Oh, no, there's, a, there's a hand raised from the Z family. Oh. Yeah, um, how are you doing? This is uh, Mike Sharansky again with 559 Sawmill Road. Uh, I had brought up the questions earlier. Um, and some of them were addressed about the um, setback, making sure that... Uh, that the uh, commission believed and uh, that Waldo Associates had an opportunity to uh, look at that setback and make sure that that was falling in line. It looks kind of close from, from my view, but again, you know, just as long as you were able to take a look at it. And the existing well, obviously that is, that's my well, that's my family's drinking water. So obviously I do have a concern where it looks that the the perimeter or the, you know, the very edge of the proposed um, septic system does come up right to the edge of that 75 feet. Uh, we're probably talking inches. So, um, you know, again, just making sure that uh, uh, that is giving proper attention. Uh, I certainly would be uh, concerned if there is any issue related to the well. And of course, I'd probably uh, also uh, reiterate some of the earlier comments about blasting. I can tell you that uh, that is pure rock there. It's exposed rock, it's exposed bedrock, because I know because I have the same thing um, behind my house, um, and it extends directly into that property um, quite a bit. So, um, I mean, perhaps not where the house is. I, you know, I'm not sure how you played it out, but obviously there's, there's substantial rock in that area. So the blasting concern and having a house from 1960 and a foundation from 1960, again, I'll, I'll echo that blasting concern and uh, what that could possibly have to do with a, quite a very old foundation, which is probably not more than a hundred to, you know, we can measure how far it is, but we're not very far away from the proposed, uh, you know, property on house uh, a lot four. So again, that would be just my, uh, my concerns. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be beautiful houses and look forward to having new neighbors, but I think it just, it would make sense for the commission to and work with Waldo Associates to make sure that uh, those concerns are being met. Again, the, the well, making sure that we are not any closer than necessary to my existing well and uh, making sure that that setback is in fact gonna be achievable. Again, that, that lot four does look like, like I mentioned earlier, is pretty well shoehorned in there. It looks like one of the toughest lots that are proposed. Um, quite a challenge to fit it all into that space, so. Just again, having uh, everybody just take a quick look at that and make sure that uh, um, we're doing everything correct there. Yeah, obviously the, the building department um, would have to approve as well as the health department approve um, septic location and, and full knowledge of where your well is. And if it's not within the compliant distance, they would tell the developer such. Um, yeah. with, respect, with respect to the blasting, I would, Again, perhaps um, have you, I'd encourage you to consult, uh, George, with the fire marshal, is that correct? Yes. I would encourage you to consult with him and say, you know, here are my concerns. What, you know, can you help me understand it? And, you know, what can we do to mitigate it? Uh, again, I'd encourage you to seek the, the advice and counsel of the professionals. And I'm sure George um, can help you do that <laughs> for a period of time. Okay, this is Dorothy Velosen. I have a comment or a question. Sure. Uh, one, 179 Flat Metal Road. And I guess I'm going back to the issue of access by the utility company. Obviously, uh, it doesn't appear as if there was a right of way granted or whatever, but it's uh, there's obviously a strong need to make sure that utilities are able to be provided. I'd like to understand how that's going to take place and whether it's the developer together with the utility companies that will provide some solution. I would like to know what that solution is. 
George, uh, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, there is no easement in place with respect to the utilities. Um, it's obviously in everyone's best interest, but I think it probably comes to a legal matter and Attorney Beatty can help me out here as to um, what can be imposed upon a developer with respect to utility easements for utilities that are in place, if any. I, I don't know. I don't believe that the commission can require that the applicant grant an easement over his property to uh, the neighbors for utilities, particularly when the utility poles that are serving those properties are on the neighbor's property. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't be in a position to negotiate with Eversource what type of easement to serve uh, the neighbor's properties for utility poles that are on the neighbor's lots. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, you, Eversource has an interest in making sure that their customers get power delivered. Uh, but I can I can share with you that in other matters, they're, they're unfortunately over the development of properties throughout the state, there have been many instances when utility poles were installed without easements being granted to the utility companies. And the utilities companies take this up, take the opportunity when somebody wants to upgrade their service or relocate a telephone pole to say, hey, you know what, we don't have an easement over this property. Let's try and get an easement put in place. Uh, but again, I'm sorry, I, again, there, there will be an issue because those poles and the utilities will be servicing the new development. So it is a shared responsibility. Well, that I guess that's an open question is where, how are the new houses going to be served? That is an open question. I mean, at, at the moment, the, the lot three old Volpe house is served by this same spur line coming come, and, and his, his service comes off of the pole that's on my property, the Glazer property. So it, it would be in the interest of the homeowner there to preserve access in some fashion. Uh, and uh, I would assume that the other properties will similarly come off of that spur line, unless I don't, you know the developers here just can some, can you state what your plans are for electrification of the properties? Yes, uh, Frank Corsini. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm just looking. Can I, anybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, Frank Corsini. Um, I live on 478 Sawmill Road, right down the street from the property. I've been here for 30 years, been in town for my entire life. The, 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 the answer to the immediate question is uh, lots one uh, and two are going to be served uh, from a pole on Flat Meadow Road and from the power source on, there's an electrical power pole right on Sawmill Road that is right near lot two. So those two will be served from those areas, not from this line that we're speaking about that's on on the neighboring property. The uh, lot number four, again, will be coming off of a pole that's on Sawmill Road. So we do not plan to utilize the poles um, that are on the eastern side of the property. So what, what about uh, the lot three? Lot three, the existing house? Yeah. Uh, that was just, we just found out that that was tied into that, pro, uh, that pole today. Um, and as of right now, that would stay. And if they needed to access the current, anyone that would buy, buy that house probably would access that pole line from their property. <laughs> well, I hope that answers some questions. I know there are still questions out there, um, but I'd like to keep things moving along. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor or against this application? Would someone like to make a motion to close? Motion to close. Second. Okay, I'll call the vote. Sean Cosgrove. Aye. Frank D'Andrea. Yes. Jamie Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace. Yes. Scott Edmund. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. And I'll also vote to close. Uh, we'll have discussion on this, obviously, after we go to the next two items. Next item is Christopher Healy, Boston Post Road, Map 78, Lot 13, Zone TS-2R-8, Petition for Zone Boundary Change. Who's here to present this? Yeah. Hi, Hi. Trent <laughs> Good evening. He's on overtime. 
<laughs> so thank you, Mr. Crowell, for bringing that up. So this is uh, our request uh, in connection with the application to change the zoning map uh, to designate the entire parcel at um, assessor's map 78 lot 13 within the MUC2 zone in connection with the proposed uh, mixed use develop, development of the site with a commercial building uh, towards uh, uh, Boston Post Road and eight proposed condominium units towards the rear of the property. Uh, this application was submitted following our uh, public hearings on a prior application in October and in November where the, um, the sense that the applicant got from the commission was that a more preferable uh, designation of this lot rather than making it all TS2 uh, as it is, <coughs> as it partially is right now, it might be a better fit uh, from a development perspective to change it to an MUC2 uh, zone uh, designation, which would limit the types of uh, activities that would be permitted on the site. So that's that's what we're here before you. So. This is, we've, we sent a, uh, in connection with the new application, we sent a new letter out, a, a letter out to the neighboring property owners within that 500 mile, 500 foot rather, uh, distance from the subject property. Uh, and uh, um, we haven't received any, uh, similar to the prior application, we haven't received any uh, correspondence from any of them objecting to the proposal. They haven't said they were in favor of it either. There was no response, so. That's where yeah, we there are. There was a letter from Kevin McGee, though. There was a letter from Kevin McGee, yes. Oh, uh, let's see. Who have we not heard from? Uh, we've heard from everyone, so let's just go back. Frank, you want to grab this letter from Kevin McGee, please? Sure. Can you please put it up? I got it here, right here. Hold on one sec. Uh, dated December 14th, 2021 to the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission from Kevin McGee, the environmental planner. Um, this is a zone change proposed from an R8 to an MUC2, Boston Post Road. Um, do we have a number on that? No, no it number be approved. Okay. I am opposed to the proposed zone change for the southern portion of the property located at Boston Post Road, Assessor's Map 78, Lot 13 from an R8 to an MU slash C2. The pro proposed zone change would be harmful to the environment with the rear portion of the property sloping towards the adjacent significant wetland systems of Wolf Swamp and Holdley Creek. The uses in table five of the regulations for the MU slash C2 zone that I see are harmful to the significant wetlands area, our lodging facilities, short and long-term healthcare facilities, increased density of housing units, eight per acre, retail manufacturing and compounding facilities, research laboratories and printing and publishing establishments. The increased density with eight units per acre lodging and healthcare facilities have a high sanitary flow towards which could affect the significant wetland system. The Town of Guilford Natural Resource Inventory and Assessment published in January of 2005 noted this area wetlands, which is located south and west of the zone change on the Guilford Land Conservation Trust property as significant wetlands. Recognizing the importance of the wetlands complex, the natural resource inventory recommended an intact 300 foot uplands buffer around the significant wetlands. Keeping the southern section of the property as a residential as R8 zone helps to maintain a buffer adjacent to the significant wetlands. Can you scroll, please? Oh, I'm not sure. Or is that it? Oh, I, that's it. That's it. <laughs> so, um, any You're comments? You're on a roll. You're on a roll, Frank. Yeah. I didn't want to stop. I have a question, uh, Phil. Yes. I, I, maybe I'm confused as to the last meeting that we had. Is I thought that that was the zone that was allowing for all those different types of uses. No, the, the, the TS2 is a much heavier industrial use zone. And obviously the concern that we had um, was that, you know, once we approve something, then the... Mm -hmm owner can do what they want by right, right. as opposed to um, you know, what, what they right. might be allowed to do in a residential zone. And we right. made a request that the MUC2 zone um, is much more restrictive in terms of activities that can be done. Obviously, 
Kevin McGee lists a whole bunch of things that to the best of my knowledge are not being proposed. Um, and obviously we don't have any applications with respect to development and we'll have quite a bit of oversight on that um, when those are brought forward. Okay, thank um, you. The, Mr. Johnson, the, the one thing that I would add to that is that one of the items that Mr. McGee does highlight in his memo and uh, is that is the increased density of housing units on the property. And that is what we are proposing to do with the condominium units. So I don't I don't want it to seem as though no, no, no I understand. But yeah. you're not looking to put in a compounding facility or research laboratory, that, printing or publishing. No, no, we're not looking to do Healthcare? either. Healthcare. Nope. Okay. You know, retail manufacturing. I don't think so. I, I don't know what the commercial use uh, towards, but that that commercial use is closer to towards the post road, and I think would be outside oh, of that I mean, 300 foot upwind buffer. I I, I do appreciate. Uh, Kevin McGee's input, but I think we, in, in my opinion, we, you know, we will see an application that we will have oversight on uh, and, and to the best of our ability, um, protect the, you know, inland wetlands, as opposed to basically restricting this to a single family home. Right. I, I, I have a question about the three, 300 foot upland uh, buffer. That's just a suggestion, is it? Am I reading that correctly? It's, it's not an, a, a recommended, but it, it still it holds to the standard of 100 for if you went before wetlands with this. The upland review area, yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, Attorney Beatty, this is Jamie. Can you can we put that map back up and can you just kind of show us what 300 versus 100 feet from that uh, re natural resource is? I just don't know if that's indicated on the map. I'm just trying to get a sense for the recommended buffer versus the required buffer. Uh, unfortunately, neither uh, the survey that George, if he's able to bring it up, won't show where the Wolf Swamp boundary is because it's on the Land Conservation Trust property. It's not on this property. And we didn't survey that uh, uh, to show where that boundary might be. The other issue, and I would normally try and help, is that the GIS viewer is down. Oh, geez. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just this kind of, I guess, I guess I can rephrase the question. Does the 300 foot buffer render this parcel in question unusable? No. I, I don't think it renders it unusable. I, I think the from the site plan uh, drawing that my client had prepared, and I don't know if George, if you have a copy of that in your in your files, it yeah, looks I, to be. I should have that. But it, it also shows a 500 foot circle around it. So you get a certainly a sense of scale. That's true. I, I guess the issue is we don't really have any knowledge as to where, you know, from this current drawing, where Wolf Swamp or Hoadley Creek. Yeah, we can. We can't right. tell. Right. I, um, I, will, I, I will note that if, if, if when the uh, site plan comes up, by my rough guess, it looks like it's about 100 feet from the boundary of the nearest proposed dwelling to the property line. So, um, yeah, right, right down. Yes, thank you, George. If you go down George, to the George, do you know where the wolf thing uh, swamp is, George? Ge geographically, it's down in this area here. Okay. Yeah. No, that's the Racchio property that was recently sold. Oh, I'm no, sorry. So it's down. Yeah, it's over. It's in this area here, the, the land trust. <laughs> exactly yeah. where it is, I can't. I don't. I don't have that information. Um. <clears throat> But so it, what's the rear setback there? I can't tell uh, the distance there. Is it 30, 50, 30 feet? It's setback from the property line? Yeah, just uh, so you get a sense of scale. Uh, that's a, hmm. um, what's the distance from here th right now? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's um, right. Let me try to see if it looks, like, it looks like 80 feet, in my Holy. estimation. 
Oh yeah, because maybe down at the bottom you can see that. Uh, you know, the... So you go down. So I don't know. This yeah, is the... on the left. On the left, there's a point to point from the corner to the first point. That's forty one feet. Oh yeah, exactly. Good call. And so, so that's eighty it, feet right there. It's about eighty so, feet, probably. Yeah. <clears throat> I think this must be the fifty foot line right here. That would be my guess. Yeah. Oh, that's that looks more like twenty, but yeah. On the uh, side. I don't I meant, know. I meant, I meant from the distance to the uh, conservation trust property. Okay. Gotcha. I don't see yeah, any I think other that's about, uh, on this map anywhere. Jeff, is this property just south of the red roof? It's just west of the red roof. As you're headed towards Branford, you go past the red roof and it's, the red, this is it's red roof right by. here. Yep. I think this, this is red roof right here. I think you're right. I'm going to quick screen share for you, Jeff. <clears throat> yeah, please do. Perceptual versus. No, I, I, uh, I do. So, think so if this is if, if just to give you a sense of where, where we're talking about again, here's um, Guilford, Com Guilford Commons with rock pile. Sorry. And when you go up the hill, red roof is here. And we're talking about this property here coming back, going diagonal. I can't exactly do it, but right. like that. that that's accurate, right. yes. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to, and I, I, again, I, I can't specifically tell where Wolf Swamp or Holy Creek would be, but I'm assuming that this area here yeah. is the Land Conservation Trust property. Kind of that kind of brighter green is the uh, swamp. Yeah, I would go with the different shading and be where the water is. Okay, so I just again, thank just you, from a perspective standpoint. Um, are there any questions from commissioners? Um, Are there any questions or comments from the public with respect to this application? Um, I guess I would throw it back. George, do, are we required to have two meetings with respect to a zone boundary change? Subject to the subject to the waiver. Yes, you can wait. You you're required, but you can waive, just like any just like any other application. Okay. Well, then I would. Um, if we were to require a second application, we would not close, we would continue, right? Yes. So I, I would kick it back to the commission just to get a feeling for how you feel about this as to whether or not you want to continue this to another meeting or you want to close and act on this this evening. I'm in favor of closing act. and acting. Thank you. I, I'm, I echo Bill's sentiments exactly. Okay, Scott? Uh, Okay. I, yes, Sean. I will continue. Okay. Frank? I'm good with closing. And Jamie? Um, <laughs> I'm uh, somewhere in the middle. I mean, what, what further information could we get from a second? I mean, Sean, what are your thoughts here on what, what other information? Well, I, you know, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about is the, is the conservation land and the, and, the, and the drainage issue. And you know, just want to know more about what's going to be happening with runoff. Because right, and I, I think we get a lot more of that when, in fact, a development plan comes before us. Um, yeah, I, okay. I think I, that's kind of where I follow, follow along similar lines, Philip. With like that's the, right. the special permit process. I mean, there is something to be said. I, I know that some commissioners have said in the past that you never know what's going to happen with the next commission, um, but at the same time, like the commission is supposed to be representing current public opinion, right? So, yeah. I don't know if we can really plan against that. Um, I, I think so, I have. So, but Scott, Scott, what are you saying? No, I'm saying I'm saying I personally feel that 
having a special permit in place, I, I'm agreeing with Phil. It's like there is a mechanism for us to ensure that the proper drainage and, and whatever else is, is in place to protect the natural resources um, as part of a special permit process. I'm saying that previously other commissioners have said that they're concerned about that uh, leaning on that ability because you never know what the next commission makeup is going to be and what their opinions are. I just, I personally feel like that's not a, cons that's not something we can really make a judgment call about now. Um, I think I'm going to have to double check this, Scott, but I think the multifamily housing in this zone is a site plan application, not a special permit. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to take a moment and double check but, that. But, and sure. Yeah, you so, know the answer to that, Jeff. Okay. Yeah. But I think and, as Phil points out, it still comes under our purview as to, right. and it's going to got to it's got to go before wetlands, correct, uh, Jeff? Still, has, still is a it, super wetland application. Yes, it's still and it's, it's still a site plan application. Um, you have all the protections associated with those things. Okay. So the, right. it's a question of whether yeah you want to lean Thank lean you. on those. I think the process. point we gave before was that we wanted to. Excuse me, just, just a second. I have thing. to go through. George, you just muted yourself. Oh, he, I think he has to take a bio break. But I have a, I have a question again. Um, do we do in a site plan review. Do we have the ability to talk about the extent of clearing of a lot? I mean, this is a this and the previous application are heavily wooded. And I just, I'm worried about the ability during this, the additional opportunity to comment on the development. Uh, I, in, in my knowledge, we don't, we don't really have the ability to, to talk about lot clearing. That's not in the regs, is it? If I recall it, they believe they have to note trees of significance. 18 inches or larger, I think it was. Oh. Mm. Welcome back, George. Sorry, um, right. I, I had to turn the alarm off in the building. <laughs> oh my God. The fire department's good. coming. I don't oh, know. Uh, it used to be, 10 used to be the police be, uh, headquarters. So I think at uh, 10 o'clock it must go off. Oh, well. Wow. Uh, George, I, I had a question. Um, you know, if, if we do move forward with this and it, and it comes back for a site plan review, do we as a commission have an ability to regulate or uh, discuss clearing of the site? Absolutely, is, yes. We do. You okay. do, and the Wetlands Commission will also, also have a substantial authority uh, with regard to clearing and grading. So in fact, they're, I think they have more authority than you do Okay. In terms of that type of issue, assuming it's assuming the work is taking place within the uh, the review area, which it okay. would be it would be in this case. So the site plan would show sort of like trees being cleared, landscape right. plan. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I mean, my my main concern is just the the the, the lowlands that'll be impacted by drainage, clearing of trees runoff and i think uh, jamie was referencing that also so i just you know i just want to be sure that we're covering a lot of bases to make sure that um conservation land is not impacted so does that mean like uh infiltration rates on the property and uh, yeah, sure. where the wetland is in proximity to but the I, I I think in the wetland as, as George stated would probably have a lot more influence in terms of restrictions uh, and ability to I, make I, decisions to protect. I, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, that being said, um, would someone like to make a motion to waive the second public hearing and close. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, I'm going to call the vote on this one then. Uh, Sean Cosgrove. Yeah. Aye. <laughs> Frank DeAndrea. Aye. I'm with. By the way, I'm with you in terms of doing all the protections, but I. Yeah, um, I, I, I know. I know. Jamie Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace. Yes. Scott Edmond? Yes. Bill Freeman? 
Yes. And I will also vote to waive and close. We'll act on this this evening, Jeff. Thank you. Um, hey, just to just to reassure time. reassure people, um, as most of you probably already know, the Guilford and the Wetlands Commission is, uh, I want to say, notorious for the aggressiveness <laughs> in the manner in which they protect wetlands. <laughs> They're militants. I would, well, I would well, hope, yeah. I would, yeah. I would well, rather you, I would rather you say historic rather than. Yeah. Diligent. They're just diligent, diligent, not militant. Diligent. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't, don't. <laughs> yeah. Notorious is not the right word. Could I suggest <laughs> Nellis? Could I suggest <laughs> Nellis? All right. How many hours over? Russ has been waiting very patiently. Next item, Eagle View Homes LLC, 405 Bristol Street. <laughs> Map 28, okay. lot five, zone I1. Special permit, right. site plan and coastal site plan to demolish existing site and construct three. 5,962 square foot residential buildings with underground parking and three dash four bedroom units. Thank you for your patience, Russ. Sorry wow. about the diligence. Wow. And the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you very much. I'm Russell Campaign from CK Architects, uh, 131 Boston Street here in Guilford. And um, I'm also going to be co presenting with um, Seamus Morin from um, Lorero Engineering. Um, uh, and as well on the line here, Joe uh, Gaudio and uh, Kurt Wittes are also on the line as the owners of the property, um, and they can chime in if something comes up that, um, that begs their, uh, their input. Um, so I'll give a, a brief history of um, what we've been doing with the property, exploring options for it, and, um, and then I'm going to pass it to Seamus to present the site. And then he'll pass it back to me to present the architecture, landscape, and lighting, and uh, probably address some of the letters that have been uh, submitted. So first, um, uh, there was an approval for this parcel uh, with a 15-unit townhouse development, similar to what we have laid out um, that was approved in 2015. Um, the uh, owner of that property at the time never executed it, um, and uh, it was bought. Um, by my clients. We explored that and felt that actually the width of the property um, and really how, how the lit units laid out and their density um, was too much for the property. So we explored many different iterations um, and actually um, took several to a fairly high level to sort of see and test them out. And um, a lot was happening with understanding of what the FEMA constraints were, um, what the criteria of the Town Center South was, et cetera. And we actually brought a couple iterations both to staff and to um, uh, design review for feedback uh, the first iteration was a higher density development that had um, three seven unit um, apartment flat style buildings. And the feedback we received from design review was that they felt it was um, you know, too large for the property given its location and context. And so we went back to the drawing boards and have come up with a, um, a scheme that has been well supported by design review. We've been to them twice and gotten very positive feedback and I think incorporated almost all of their, um, their uh, you know, um, uh, concerns that were pre presented. And so now we've settled on 12 units on the property in three buildings set up as a town townhome style development. And one thing I would like to correct on the notice um, is that the 5,000 plus or minus square feet, that is the footprint of each of the three buildings. It's not the area of each of the units. Um, so I just wanted to sort of correct that. Um, so um, I also want to say that in looking through the Town Center South, because we are here for an application for a special permit uh, based on the Town Center South regulations, we feel that this really um, fits nicely into the criteria set forth in Town Center South and is doing it in such a way that really I don't think has any negative implications. Um, it's a good use for the parcel. It's taking an industrial use and turning it into a res residential use um, that I think in all ways is going to be a better for the community. Um, and, uh, and I think it will leverage its location, its views, its proximity to the train station in town. Um, so I think on all levels, it's, it's quite good. So with that said, I think um, we can pass it over um, to Seamus if we can share screen um, and Seamus um, can introduce himself and actually present um, the site engineering portions of the site plan. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> uh, thank you, Commission, uh, for staying late and having us tonight. My name is Seamus Moran. A uh, professional engineer in Connecticut. Uh, I'm part of the design team uh, representing the applicants um, for their project located at 405 Whitfield. So I will share my screen if that's okay now, and I can walk you through the existing condition, um, some proposed conditions um, before I turn it back over to Russ, who can go over the exciting stuff, which is the buildings uh, and the architecturals. So um, 
For now, I will share my. Can everybody see the screen? Hopefully, it's going to load here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'll start with the existing conditions. So uh, you may be familiar with the site. It's located at uh, south of Whitfield Street at the corner of Pages Lane and Whitfield Street. Uh, it's a developed site right now. Um, there were two former buildings, one about just under 5,000 square feet and one just over 1,500 square feet. Those are actually recently removed. It's shown on the existing condition plan. The existing condition plan was done several months ago. Since then, those buildings have been removed and demolished. Uh, same with the bituminous pavement. Um, there is bituminous pavement out there and some gravel. Um, some of that is disturbed at this point, but it's, it's still um, substantially there. Um, there are utilities in Pages Lane and Whitfield, both gas, water, and overhead power. Um, the entire parcel, what, what you see here before you is actually about three acres of it. The entire parcel is about 7.3 acres. The rear 4.4 acres of the parcel is tidal wetlands. Those were flagged by Jim Cowan back in January. Um, so what you see here is the 2.9 acres of upland area um, that remain in the northeast section of the parcel. Um, we're in the industrial I-1 zone and the Guilford Town Center South zone and also the coastal area management zone. Um, so we are here for a special permit for the multifamily development in the special um, in the Guilford Town Center South Overlay District and a site plan application and a CAM application. Um, so next I'll just go on to the proposed condition here. Uh, I'll keep it uh, zoomed out uh, so we can get a general idea here. Three buildings you see here, um, working from actually right to left on the page is building A, building B, and building C. Um, we are proposing three separate buildings. Each of these buildings will have four three bedroom units in there. So a total of 12 units, uh, each with three bedrooms in it. Uh, we're proposing a, a front access drive with some uh, 15 uh, surface parking spaces for some overflow parking and accessible parking. Um, on the Whitfield side of the units, on the back side of the units, we're proposing a, a separate entrance for some drive under garages. Uh, each unit will have a two car garage uh, dedicated to each of the units for a total of 24 drive under parking spaces within the garages. Um, as I mentioned, utilities will we'll be accessing utilities off of pages. We'll have a water and gas line um, to the rear of the units here. I won't get all the way in. I'll probably get too much into the weeds. Um, but um, in the rear drive, we're proposing a gas line and a water line coming off of pages. And out in the front, we currently show uh, underground electric um, along the uh, along the eastern edge of the of the development. Which, um, as you'll as we'll get into later for Janice's comments, we'll see we may be relocating that to the west side of the development. But for now, it's proposed on the east side. Um, we are proposing some um, walkways. Uh, throughout the site, we're proposing a walkway along Pages Lane um, and also a public use, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, uh, a public uh, access easement, I'm sorry, public access easement along Pages Lane. That's this hatching that you see here. Um, that'll get, that provides access for uh, the public to come down our property. Pages Lane is actually owned by um, the developers themselves. So it's a public access easement to come down Pages Lane over the walkway that we're proposing um, to just south of the proposed drive um, across a boardwalk to a platform so the public can access the platform and um, view the wetlands um, and um, that be provided. So um, moving on to the grading and drainage, I'll go over that quickly. Um, if I'm going too fast, please slow me down. Otherwise, we can come back to it at the end, but I want to get to the good stuff with the rest. So um, the grading and drainage and stormwater, what you see before you, we're provo proposing four separate um, stormwater treatment practices. And this, is, this was designed uh, based on the Connecticut uh, Stormwater Quality Manual, the Low Impact Development Appendices, um, the Guilford Stormwater Management Standards, and the, the Guilford Guidance Document for Low LID um, BMPs. So what we have before you here is on the front of the property, everything is grading from the front of the buildings out to a shallow pitch swale. Uh, this is called a grass drainage channel as it's defined in the water quality manual. And that's designed to attenuate, um, and it's designed to slow down some of the runoff, allow it to infiltrate and treat the runoff before it gets into uh, the natural grade along the Eastern property line. 
So this is designed to attenuate uh, peak rates, um, allow for some infiltration and allow for treatment of runoff. To the rear of the property, um, all of the runoff that's captured in the pavement to the rear of the property will be directed to the southeast corner where it'll sheet flow across a vegetated filter strip that is longer than required in the, the manual just to provide a, additional uh, treatment. Um, and that is designed to treat the treat and infiltrate the water quality volume. So this was designed based on uh, hydrologic group soil, uh, hydrologic uh, soil uh, group C, which uh, was only a 0.1 inches per hour infiltration rate. So it's designed to have a berm on the down gradient edge. Um, so the, the runoff will uh, get to the edge of the pavement here, sheet flow down the vegetated filter strip, will allow, uh, it'll pool maximum of 12 inches deep to, to infiltrate the water quality volume before it spills over um, uh, sheet flow over the, the spillway. Um, an additional um, BMP that we're pro providing, providing is uh, an infiltration somewhat basin below building A. Um, so what you'll see is there's this faint hatch that you probably can't really tell from, from Zoom. But there's a faint hatch underneath the back two thirds of the building. That's a one and a half foot bed of stone that is designed to infiltrate the roof runoff from all three buildings. So you see all these uh, roof leader collection pipes. Those are all discharging to this stone bed, one and a half feet of stone below the building to allow it to infiltrate into the underlying soil. There's an under drain and outlet control structure designed uh, to allow the larger storms above the water quality volume to bypass and discharge um, just outside the, uh, the water, uh, the um, coastal jurisdiction. Um, last but not least, we uh, on the far west side along Pages Lane, there's a low point along Pages Lane that we are just collecting the runoff along Pages Lane and some of the grass areas, discharging it to a hydrodynamic separator that's designed to, to remove 80% uh, TSS in the water, in the water quality flow, um, discharging to a level spreader, and then discharging um, sheet flowing overland after that. So four separate stormwater management practices uh, designed across the site. Um, so that is the, the crux of the stormwater design. Um, if you go on to the next page, erosion and sediment control, I don't really have to get too much into this, but we are providing uh, obviously um, substantial ENS controls, uh, construction entrances, hay bale back silt fence, uh, temporary diversion swales and temporary sediment basins as necessary. Um, last but not least, there is a septic design. So that is on the uh, the east, northeast side of the buildings between the buildings and Whitfield Street. This was designed um, and approved by, um, this was designed, was, I'm sorry, this was approved by the health the district, health department um, on August, August on um, December 8th of, uh, of this year. So that was reviewed and approved and um, there's no further comments from the health department on that. Um, I think that is, Probably it on my part for now. I think we'll get into probably. Hey, can, I ask you, can, can I ask you a quick question? Of course. Um, you have you. It, this has to do with the one and a half foot crushed stone uh, collection basin. Is that what we're calling it? Infiltration. Yeah, basin. Yep. Um, do we know what the elevation of that is? And I guess my question is, if in fact we had a severe storm with flooding, is that going to flood? And how does that how does that interact with, you know, a significant potential rainfall with yeah. water rise? Great, that's a great question. So that was we did account for that. Um, so what it, what is in here is there's this under drain that you see that's set at the bottom of the basin. I'm sorry, bottom of the infiltration practice, um, which is elevation 5.5. So the stone is at the bottom of the stone is 5.5. The top is seven. The under drain set at 5.5 connects to an outlet control structure. This outlet control structure has a weir in there. So as the water pools, it'll pool up to elevation six. That's where the weir is set in this outlet control structure. It'll spill over the weir and a discharge down. It'll get into this manhole and down uh, to this outlet uh, structure here, to this flared end section. So it'll start discharging at elevation six. So actually the water quality volume is everything below elevation six where our um, uh, our actual top of our, our infiltration practice is elevation seven. So there's another foot of pooling 
uh, on top of uh, the six inches of infiltration below the water, the, the, the weir. And what, so, it, it, so, it so it, following up on Phil's question, what is what is our Guilford's high water mark for that area of town? So we have a, a lot of soil testing on the site, and we had to, to demonstrate what we ended up demonstrating on the septic plan is that based on all the soil testing that we have available to us, that it's a flat groundwater um, across the site, and we averaged the maximum high groundwater across the site, and it came out to elevation 2.7. Um, so that is the average high groundwater that was observed during test pits for modeling or groundwater um, through all of the, I think, 35 or so test pits that were conducted. Uh, over how many years? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm less concerned about groundwater and more like flood. Yeah, it's a storm, storm surge. Flooding. Storms. Do we have a, a baseline as to you know where water got to during the hurricanes? To for yeah, lack right. Of and also, Seamus, uh, this is Jamie. Maybe if you could just talk about the existing site elevations, the proposed elevations, the base flood elevation, design flood elevation. I mean, I think I just want to learn like what's going on in this site? What's the elevation of Pages Lane? How are you doing dry egress? I mean, there's so many elevation questions here, if you could. Yeah, so we have been working with the town engineer Janice on a lot of the grading um, for several months on this. So if we, if we want to get into the details of that, what you see here, and I'll zoom in a little bit, is the, the Limwa line. So there are three separate designations on the property for FEMA purposes. And actually, I'll take a step back for a second. There is a, a, a LOMER that was approved in July for this, essentially for this property um, that modifies the flood zone designations. And that is effective uh, December 17th. So it's not effective yet, but we have designed our site based on that. So what you see here is a Limwa line can you please just define that for the public? Uh, I mean, it, it's, hard, it, it's hard to define the lines. Please, please yeah. define the lines. So here, um, this line here, if you can follow my cursor, mm -hmm. this yeah. is the edge of, of the yeah. Limwa line. Right. And it comes around. So building A falls within the Limwa. So it's on the water side of the Limwa, which is AE elevation 12. Which is the limit of wave action? Sorry, yes, just limit of moderate. Sorry, limit of moderate wave action. That's correct. Um, so it's not it's not the V zone, but it is treated, or we are treating it almost as a V zone. So the building will have breakaway walls. It will be elevated um, above the flood zone elevation by a, I believe it's two feet. It's a, a elevation twelve is the AE zone. Um, we're proposing that the finished floor be at fourteen, so the lowest horizontal member is above that 12. So that's building A is designed essentially for V standards because it's within the limb line. Buildings B and C, which is the middle building and the westernmost building, those are located outside the limb line in AE elevation 11. So the finished floors um, and the buildings are being designed based on AE standards, which is different construction than VE standards. So whatever, anything below flood, flood elevation requires flood venting, um, which is the garages for these units. But everything for building C is outside the flood zone. So why, why didn't we put this, the stormwater foot and a half gravel in building two versus building three? So it's outside of the Limois. Uh, elevation reasons. We, in order to get, uh, we couldn't get A into B because the, the grade is lower for A. We had to with that limb wall line I was just describing that follows through here, right. we also kept our fill out of the limb wall line. So everything upland of the limb wall, um, we were providing fill so we could raise the site. Um, mm. Same with parking and everything within the limb wall and close to the limb wall, we reduced the fill on the site. So that way it's much lower lying. Um, so it potentially wouldn't get washed away. And, and, and so Seamus, if the if the um, if the buildings um, so the, the 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 flooding area <clears throat> they basically it is building one or one or three. I'm sorry. Say that again. So where where your cursor is right now? It's building yes. two or building one. A building A is what we're calling it. A building is on a, the right side. A. Yeah. Okay. So 
if there is flooding in the in the other two buildings, is there conduit to take it down into those other areas? Is there flooding in these? I mean, if, there's if, flooding there's in these... if there's flooding in building C and B, does it automatically go down into the... So buildings B and C are designed to be outside the flood zone since they're in the AE zone. So it's AE elevation 12 um, and the grades in the building. So the finished floor is I believe 12 and a half. Uh, so the first floor is 12.1. Um, it is 12.5, this is a typo here. So it's 12.5 and the garages um, for building C are at 12.5. 12.0 and the garages for building B are in the flood zone, but they have flood beds. So everything um, okay. interior will, so the building themselves are outside the flood zone. Um, the garages for building B will have flood beds. So everything will drain uh, in case of a storm event, but they are outside the, they're designed for AE standards. Hmm. All right. Is the crushed stone area, this is Bill Freeman under uh, A, is for roof leader runoff, is that correct? That's correct. Roof yeah, leader, so roof, yeah. roof runoff. The rest of the uh, rest of the site water is being taken care of by the other three areas that you uh, uh, pointed out, correct? That's correct. Yep. And the reason for that and is the, and they're all runoff. and they're all open, they're all open garages essentially. Either they have floodgates or they have breakaway walls, depending on if you're in A, B, or C. That's right. That's correct. And I, I'm, I don't want to belabor this, but it is, <clears throat> are all these people that are going to be buying these places, are they going to have to buy flood insurance? So that, um, I believe it will be flood insurance for the site in each, each of the buildings because the buildings are each within the flood zone. So I believe they all will be required to have flood insurance. Mm -hmm. That would probably fall to the homeowners association as their con condos, correct? I can leave that up to the owners how they plan to uh, lease these or sell these. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure yet. Okay. Um, Seamus, this is Jamie. Can you just walk me through the basis of the letter of map revision? We, we haven't seen that yet. And I know Janice's comments kind of hinge on that. So, so if I look at the FEMA maps here, what, what, what is the reasoning there that you think, or that it is changing? So Rob Sonickson from Waldon Associates, I actually think he might be on the line. He could, um, if he's on the line, he can answer this, but he, he worked with Janice to revise, uh, to, to run the model to, to see what the flood zone would be and to see how much of the site based on existing conditions um, would be outside the Limois. Um, because as of right now, the entire site uh, is encumbered by the Limois. However, there was a, a, a Limois or a Lomer um, prepared and approved several years ago for um, an abutting property. And it suggests that the whole site shouldn't be encumbered by the, the, the Limois line. So when they ran the analysis, it was determined that that the Limois line that you see here that comes through the site, that is actually how the Limois line would fall based on the current analysis. So by doing it, it helps obviously remove the Limois from a portion of the site and helps us for construction purposes, but it wasn't, you know, we, we ran the analysis based on um, the pre-existing conditions of the site. And uh, that's what we, that's what, that's how it came out. Thanks. And, and Jamie, if I could add a little to that. So uh, LOMAR is a practice that is um, provided by FEMA, FEMA um, knowing that they're an analyzing so much area of land that they don't have the accuracy that can be drawn from surveying materials right on the site. And so it's a process for something like this where you see grades that wouldn't be caught on an aerial survey um, can be refined on this and presented through an analysis with engineering. And that's, that's why they have that process available. Thanks, Russ. Um, and just the, the previous question of mine, what is the elevation of Pages Lane? What is the existing sort of elevation on which you're building, buildings B and C? Can you help us understand the amount of sure. fill that you're bringing in outside of the Lenoir line? Sure, Let's, uh, let me open up the existing conditions plan. It might be a little bit easier to see. So Whitfield is actually, it's super elevated from south to north. 
So these contours that you see here, this is a contour 12 in Whitfield. This here is a 13, there's a little isolated 13. But then as you come into the property, these contours actually drop down. So the existing grades are somewhere in the 10, 11 range across the site um, existing. So if you see this contour down here, there's a 10.4 spot grade, there's a 10 contour here. Um, so these, these contours on the site, this is the 11, 10, and as you get further to the southeast corner, the grades start to drop where the um, where you're still in the Limwa. So this here is the Limwa line. Um, so the grades on the southeast side uh, are lower than the northern side. Um, so as I said, 13 is the high point of Whitfield. I believe it's about 11 in pages. Yeah, 11.8 is the spot grade in the center. Um, and as you look at the proposed grades, which I'll get to on the next page, Um, we're proposing and uh, from working from the building out with a 12.5 where we have some shallow grades here. There's a, there's a 12 high point here to a catch basin. This is a 12, uh, I'm sorry, this is an 11 spot grade in the parking lot. So it's it's still lower than Whitfield. Thir Whitfield is 13, this is 11. Um, and as we get closer to the Eastern side of the parking lot in the front, it drops down to 10 and nine so we can get back down to existing grade at the limo line. So it, do, it does grade down towards your property from Whitfield Street. It, it's some of Whitfield does grade down. So you see this swale here. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we're proposing a swale to, to redirect this runoff coming from off the property um, mm. to where it's going now, um, just in, in a more succinct swale rather than coming across the parking lot. So, uh, uh, so the, the swale would direct the water towards the harbor? Uh, correct, there's there's a very shallow swale along the property lines. You can see if I can zoom in these very sh faint lines. This here, this contour would, here. So, so, so you would hope it would not go towards the houses down on lower Whitfield, it would go, uh, it, would, it would basically go east, towards the sound. Or it actually, it'll follow right along the property line. This is a seven contour, this is okay. a six contour, right. and it'll come down here to a low point. I believe it's a five okay. right, right. right to the wetland. So it follows pretty much along the edge of the, uh, the, uh, the property line to the edge of the wetland. Okay, All right. So the, the low point down there is like five? Um, so yeah, so the coastal jurisdiction line is four, and these darker contours that you can see here, this is elevation four, the coastal jurisdiction line. That's okay. the lowest point right. at the tidal wetlands. But then, so the five contour is just off, just obviously just north, just the upgrading of that four um, right along the edge of the tidal wetlands. All right, so you're just hoping that directional and gravitational forces will bring the water down in that direction. That's correct. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Seamus, this is Scott Edmund. Uh, I, you might have mentioned, but I just wanted to look at the, are you proposing a crosswalk to cross Woodfield? Is that what I saw? Uh, I, yeah, so let me go to that page here. So there is, it's shown yeah. off the, the site pretty much, but yes, yeah, so we're proposing right. a little right. crosswalk across Woodfield. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, so... Um, to provide access. Right now, right, right now, the sidewalk is, uh, is on the other side of Woodfield. Um, George, with the safe um safe streets ordinance have do they have anything that we would need to flag in terms of proper signage for for pedestrian crossing i don't know what kind of requirements they've put in there well there's no there's no specific ordinance um janice works closely with the safe streets committee and i okay. think she's discussed with the developer and the designers here the characteristics of this side of the sidewalk and walkway so yeah, it does, it, would safe. It, I don't. I don't. I haven't like looked at their plan in depth. They they're not planning to put a sidewalk on this side of Woodfield, are they? I don't believe so. No. Okay. Um, and my second question, I guess, might be better for um, Russ. Uh, do you know if there's any plan for low income for these uh, units mm -hmm. to be low income at all? Um, no, I do not think that there is a uh, plan. The site costs and development costs are such that this is, is not really a viable site for um, moderate income or 
or um, affordable housing. Uh, hi, this is Jamie. I just have one more question. Is work being done below the coastal jurisdiction line? No. No, we're not proposing any work. What um, there is one little error on here that we're right at the coastal jurisdiction line with our outlet pipe, and I'm gonna have to relocate that. You'll see. Okay. Um, so <laughs> uh, we're not proposing. A, so this is not a mandatory deep referral. Um, it had to go to deep just for the CAM application, but we're not proposing any work uh, in the CJL beyond the CJL. Thank you. Uh, and, and lastly, the 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 public walk is intriguing. What's the what's the thinking? about that? What's the intent? So there's been a big driver to provide public access. Um, this is a, a water dependent site because it's tidally, uh, tidally influenced in the back four plus acres. Um, so, you know, after working with the town, they would like to see something for public access. It's also good for the state that they would like to see public access. Um, so it's, you know, goodwill and uh, on the developer side to just provide public access and a, and a boardwalk so people can come down and walk the property and, and take a look at the wetlands. And the eagles. The eagles. Caught a lot of that when we were doing the restaurant at the yacht club being open to the public pre COVID public access to the water. Hmm. So um, we met with Kevin and uh, George and, and um, actually explored several scenarios and landed on this being the most viable way to gain access. One, it'll have a concrete sidewalk that runs along Cage's Lane that matches the town details and then turns and runs out to this. So it'll be fairly clear by the sidewalk that it's a public access area. Obviously we'll have signage as well, but it also I think is helpful to have it be clearly somewhere that someone can go from the public um, and so, uh, and, and we felt this was a good position for it because other areas of the site actually um, would encroach on the 25 foot setback or might be vulnerable to lowland areas that would have flooding that might damage some of the public access paths. So we decided that this was the best way to go about it um, uh, with Kevin. I think he's in support of this. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, Seamus, you ready to hand it to Russ? Love to. I'll stop sharing now and Russ can share. All right. All right, so you should be able to see uh, the architectural site plan. Is that on your screens? Yep, yep. Fantastic. So um, Seamus sort of walked you through the general site characteristics of this, and, um, and I just wanted to give a little bit more information actually on some zoning setbacks, um, just because they were raised by Janice. So um, there is a 12 foot um, parcel that runs as part of Pages Lane along this edge that was transferred with the main parcel and is owned by our clients. Um, the previous application for 15 units that was approved measured the side setback from uh, and included that 12 foot parcel. So we've continued that and measured our 30 foot setback off of that side. And I spoke to George earlier today and he's in agreement with that determination. But I will say if there's concern about the way that we've interpreted that, um, we can merge the properties as they, it's an unavailable parcel and it, and it could be merged if we needed to. Um, she also raised a concern about the um, setback on the opposite side by a raised platform that we have in the FEMA zone for our uh, mechanicals. Um, and again, I spoke to George today about this. This platform is a separate structure and under the town center south and our special permit, there are criteria for different setback requirements for different heights of buildings. And so if you're over 35 feet, like the main buildings are, you have to have a 30 foot setback. If you're under 35 feet, you have a 20 foot setback. And so even though we're three feet over the 30 foot setback on this side, um, we're compliant <laughs> under the town center south um, special permit if you approve it. Um, the other thing that's not shown on the um, site plan that Seamus just presented is we, we do have sort of a little bit more articulation to the path, and then we are proposing a center path, um, sort of a very low improvement kind of path that runs around this side and out and, and ends at the easement line on this side. Um, we're lighting it on this area, but keeping this very, um, you know, sort of low grade with no um, low lighting or anything to sort of allow it to be more natural in the way it works just as a walking path for the tenants. Um, and so that was something that she wanted incorporated onto the main site plan that's presented for Seamus and we will do that. And as I already explained, 
the public access coming down and in on this side on a public um, sidewalk, I think is working out well. And I'll show you a little bit of detail about the, um, the lookout that we're proposing, which is a little boardwalk feature similar to what was down at, um, uh, uh, at Chittenden Park. Um, so other items on here is we um, are proposing three little signage areas, um, two that are just stone um, sort of pillars at the, at the boundary edges that'll have a very small sign that's inlaid into them. And then a larger sign that sort of faces toward town along the corner here that's, um, and then that's on our property. And then um, another pier at this ed entrance for the back here that just sort of designate the perimeters of things. So that's the general site plan. If there's no other questions, um, I'll move through the plans. And so we're showing the three lower Sorry, stories. Russ, one, yes, one quick question, sure. Scott. Um, the only following up on my question about the crosswalk, with, with you inviting people to walk down the center path, um, would you well, want to yeah, consider a crosswalk for that? So, so there's going to be... Um, um, about 20 feet of town easement that will be grass. The center path ends at our property line. Um, okay. our, our interest here is not to invite the public. And actually we probably will have a private on the signage that's there. Um, uh -huh. You know, our interest here is, is for just use by the residents here. We're, we're only introducing an easement for public access along Pages Lane and across to, um, you know, to the viewing station here. And so that was raised in Janice's letter and we can discuss it. Um, but there's a lot of places, I mean, where, where paths for, for private communities will come out onto an easement and, and sort of allow for someone to cross the road independently. And it just felt like this might be a path that people would take. Um, she is not comfortable with a second crosswalk here. So it's, it's either okay. one or, or another. And we still felt that we didn't want to give up that path and just dead end on, um, you know, the ability to sort of walk through the site. So um, we can discuss concerns that were raised associated with, with sending people here, but we're not looking to attract people into the site on this side from, from the public. Um, it would only be residents that would have use of that. Is that does that answer your question? I, un or? I understand how you got to where you are, but it seems like you're inviting people to cross the road. <laughs> um, Okay. But, but even it. with a, even with 20 feet of grass um, to, right. to before that begins, I mean, I, I, I um, I think you are, I, I agree with you, you are inviting um, the residents to, um, right. and, uh, and, and if there is a, a safety concern, we can definitely talk that through and, and see. Um, but, um, but we actually proposed parking along this edge with a sidewalk, and, uh, and Janice expressed a lot of concerns about plowing and all these others, maintenance, and it doesn't go anywhere. So we, 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 we backed off from that. Um, and that, that happened very early in the process. We thought it would be a benefit and, and slow traffic along the road and allow for some additional street parking. And, mm -hmm. um, and she just didn't want to uh, entertain that from a, from a plowing and maintenance uh, point of view. So, um, okay. so, um, Thanks. so going through the units briefly, just so you have a sense of how they're laid out. Um, there's there's um, the first three plans in the sheet are showing the three different units, A, B, and C, because they're slightly different in their layout to the elevations. And so unit A, you come in at the lower grade and you come up the staircase to an area of finished space that's above the FEMA line. And so in the limo, it's one foot higher than the two adjacent units. So the finished floor is at 14 feet. And um, there is elevator access from the backside. And because we can't raise the grades in this area on these on the uh, building A, we have a front stoop that comes up um, about six feet to a platform and comes into the foyer. There's a mud room, and then you can go up the stairs to the main levels. Um, the middle unit has a much smaller change in grade going from um, nine foot six to, um, to the 12 foot six that comes up through a stoop and in. And there's also elevator access. But the front, because we can grade this area because it's out of Limwa, we're able to come in flush to grade on the front and have accessible access to this unit. Um, um, so these four units, as well as building A. And again, you go up the stairs to the main living space. And the last unit, um, which is the closest to Pages Lane, all four of these units um, are, are sort of flush transition. They'll have a pitch for drainage out of the garage, but you have a flush transition into the uh, building, both from the garage and from the front. So, um, so all the units are, are accessible for guests. They all have elevator access. 
buildings B and C, the middle building and the um, one on Pages Lane will have accessible front entries and garage access and building A has accessibility through the garage through the elevator access. Um, on the next level, um, we have a large open living plan that has a kitchen, dining and living that flows out onto a terrace that's over the garage. And there's a small study um, and, a, and a powder room and, and a pantry up in the front area of that. The next level up has two ensuite bathrooms uh, and suites uh, bedrooms. So the master is on the view side looking over the marsh with a large bathroom and a large walk-in closet, laundry, and a guest bedroom with an ensuite bathroom and shower. And the top level, which is habitable attic in the way we're laying these out with the townhouses, um, has the option of either a bedroom on the marsh side with um, a, a bath that's in the bonus area. And we have another layout that has the bedroom on the town side, on, this, on the Whitfield side, and the bonus room with a small balcony that looks out over the marsh on that uppermost level. Um, this is just showing how the lower stories integrate and how we're FEMA compliant. So this shows where our flood vents are and, uh, and, and where our elevations are and how our area calculations are for our FEMA flood vents. And the elevations, um, we've gone back and forth a couple times with design review and I think enhanced the plans. Um, so they're very similar. There's um, um, several iterations of the way we're handling the front porches. Some of the porches have um, at grade space that has room for benches and sitting. Um, and some have a balcony off of the main floor living uh, with a smaller porch entry to give, give it a little bit of diversity. We also work with them to sort of um, step the units forward and back to give it a little bit more context and wrap them back around the corner of pages to open the side up a little bit. Um, the back, um, again, sort of articulates the units going back and forth um, with large glass and balcony out of the master suite level and uh, a terrace that comes off the main living space um, with the garages facing the back for most of the units and, and this one sort of coming around and turning the corner, which was again was a, was a request of the design review to sort of articulate this side a little bit more and give it some more character on Pages Lane. You can see what we're proposing here for the lookout with a railing and a small um, boardwalk deck that's, uh, that's proposed um, for the public access. Um, and just takes a minute to load these big drawings. Um, now, this gives the side elevations um, that face Pages Lane, where you can see the two garage doors for that one unit that come in off of Pages Lane, um, and then the other end with the raised platform for the utilities. And this is an interbuilding setback, which are kind of the same on either side with the stone lower story and the shingle upper. And this just calls out the materials. Um, we're using a stone base. Um, a shingle siding on the main facades, uh, sort of a bronze copper uh, metal roofing accent in several locations, um, some decorative railings, um, probably an asphalt roof. We are entertaining potentially looking at cedar, but want to keep the option open for the asphalt. And then we're using good quality Marvin windows with simulated divided lights and bold trim. The whole package is kind of sourcing a shoreline look with um, some sort of federal lines with, with again, bold trim with um, large crowns um, and bold overhangs and um, you know just nicely articulated um, uh, authentic trim for, for sort of the shoreline area. Um, we generated a section that sort of shows building A and how we're matching, um, the, getting the grades and having the, um, the clear understory with the breakaway walls. That was for Janice to review. Um, and, uh, Let's see, let me just pull. So for the light, I'm um, sorry, for the um, landscaping design, we're working with Susan Fields on um, the layout. And again, we've gone through a couple iterations and with the feedback, um, uh, design review wanted us to save several of the red cedars that are in front. Um, there's a couple of red cedars that we're saving that are further in, in the property. She um, um, removed a couple um, of the invasive species in the sumac um, that was in the rear. And she integrated some of the existing white birch trees along the property line on this side. But we've sort of taken a very residential, um, organic kind of layout. It's not formal in its presentation um, with the trees being of different sizes and scales um, to sort of break up the front facades and try and uh, mask the buildings a little bit in the way that you're um, presented to the street. 
Um, I think we got very good feedback on our moves here as far as where we've placed the trees and how we sort of shape different views and sight lines through the building. Um, the rear area along the marsh um, is presented to transition in this area um, with um, seagrasses and other native species that would um, accommodate the salt in this area and sort of just give a buffering to the transition into the existing salt marsh area in the back. Um, these large areas um, that are used for sheet flow drainage and the swale that comes around this side will have yard areas that have some supplemental soils underneath to keep them stable um, and, and allow them to have um, sort of yard areas, um, you know, in, 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 in a salt tolerant uh, species of, of um, grass. Um, they asked us to, at design review, to give a little bit more detail of, of some of the building plantings around the building. So here we have a little bit more articulation with um, various levels of, um, of, of shrubbery and, uh, and um, perennials and some annuals in order to just give some real life to these areas close to the buildings and some screening of the mechanical areas um, to sort of enhance the walkways that move through the buildings and such. Um, for the drives, we are hoping to use an oil and stone to soften them a little bit um, from a vantage point of their appearance so they won't be a black asphalt. The paths inside the property, we're planning to use a paver, um, a concrete paver with um, granite curbing um, to sort of really have a nice rich um, feel to it um, with substance. The perimeter is being requested to be uh, to the town standards with concrete. I think that will delineate private and public and again, probably welcome people through to have the continuity of the sidewalks match the other sidewalks in town. Um, and so that's a nice delineation between the two. The terraces will be bluestone or a bluestone-like porcelain tile paver um, with the walks and the front porches being similarly done. Um, and the lighting um, uh, is, is taking a very low level of lighting approach. Um, um, the photometric plan shows that we have no light pollution off of our property. Um, one thing was raised with Kevin is to make sure that we weren't having any light pollution into the salt marsh with the species that might habitate the, um, the transition zone here, which we show we don't have any. Um, we're using a post light lamp that's about 20 feet to handle the major parking areas that we feel is kind of a nice um, low key uh, post that's not too tall, that sort of has multiple posts to cover the areas in a very controlled way. There's a low bollard um, that we're proposing actually slightly different from what's being shown here, um, but it's a full cutoff bollard it's lighting the paths here and the front walks into the buildings and, the, and between the buildings. Design review asked us to remove any of the lighting along these paths and just keep them um, you know, without any lighting, which we're fine with. I don't think there's a security issue back there at night. Um, and on the building, we've presented and there was some questions. Um, we have submitted all of the cut sheets um, uh, to show that we have cut off fixtures that meet the criteria of the, um, of the site plan review. Um, we are looking for more residential style fixtures on the building. So we have a couple sconces that are on the upper balconies. Most of the balconies are going to be light, um, lit with recessed cans underneath the ceilings of the balconies. So they'll just have a light glow and have a full cut off um, recessed can. Um, and then there are some gooseneck style uh, fixtures on the back. These will have LED integrated lights, which actually the light is a flat plate at the very top of the hood. So it is a full cutoff fixture that actually does meet the criteria of the, of the um, um, site plan review criteria. Although since it's a residential fixture, they haven't sought the dark sky certification, but it is a full cutoff given that the fixture has a 90 degree cutoff um, from the light source. And even these small hoods, the light source is right up at the top here. So there's about a two inch drop before you hit the rim of this, so these two meet the criteria of a cutoff fixture. So I think we're fully compliant with what we're proposing for the lighting, and I think it'll be a nice residential feel in keeping with the way the other properties are lit in that area. So I have um, one last piece I'd like to show you here. Um, there's a video that might give you um, a good sense of how it will feel. So this is starting the video looking at the storage units that are um, to the south east of the property here. So you can see these, um, that's the lower building and the, um, and the larger building that's adjacent to our property and I'll start the video. So we're coming down Whitfield Street toward town and you can see, um, well, this isn't really right because the, <laughs> the walkway doesn't come all the way to the street, it ends back here, but that's the idea that it would end back here with the bollards um, set back about 30 feet from the road. 
um, you can see the area where the swale comes around um, gives you um, a sense of a nice yard area. And you can see the stoops for the building A, which um, are raised above the grade, um, but still in context and keeping with other properties in the area with the front stoops. As we come through here, you can see kind of the diversity of um, scale of planting and diversity of, of style of planting we have here to sort of have a nice residential feel to it. The mill units, you can start to see have at grade access off the parking. Um, and have have a little bit of diversity in the way that they're set back from the street and and they are articulated with the roof lines we're coming down and see the sign this is at the corner of pages lane and whitfield with the entry in for the guest parking areas here with the buildings um, on your right hand side and as we come by on pages lane you can see the end unit is is very residential in its scale and in keeping with the neighborhood um, the two garages on that end give it a little bit more interest and allowed us to pull that building back a little bit and closer to Pages Lane at the request of the design review. And as we go to the back, you can see the lookout and the way that the terraces sort of favor and step back and look over the marshes and the views that we have um, to take advantage of on this property. So I think that gives a fairly um, good overall um, vision for for the uh, let me stop sharing here um, overall vision of what we're proposing on the property um, and as I said um, we've met with design review twice and gotten very good feedback from them and I think incorporated all that they've requested sorry the next video is starting to play on my computer here <laughs> whatever that is <laughs> um, let me just turn this off that's the um, and so I guess we can answer any questions. I know there's been some letters and they did raise a couple of questions that I think we're able to address. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to sort of see if there's any questions and have a little bit of a pause to catch my breath before going on with some of the other aspects of this. Um, are there any questions? Russ, what uh, do you guys hi. got for total square footage? Um, so the units each are 3,800 square, well, they're just shy of 3,800 square feet, three bedroom units. And there's 12 of them. Uh, Russ is Jamie. I, I'm not totally sold on the public access yet. Um, okay. Was there was there a proposal for a bench? Is there a, um, I mean, there, I love the video. I mean, there's, there's so much, there's so much detail and beautiful attention to detail. And that part just falls flat for me. Um. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm sure we would be able to put a bench or two on there. We could, um, you know, put one of those telescope uh, quarter telescope things on there. I mean, I, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, it's an eight by 14 viewing platform and it's drawing people into the site to have the long view down to the water. Cause you can actually see the sound from this location. And then obviously the Eagle and, and having a controlled location that people can come and view the Eagle, which is a popular, you know, a popular event. Um, so, um, you know, that was the goals that were set. And as I said, um, we did explore other options and really the feedback we received was um, having any greater depth of walking trail into the site or, or having it closer to the marsh, or, you know, is, 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 was received well. Um, and so this was what was landed on. Um, but we can enhance that. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's sized for, you know, four or five, six people to be on that at a time and, and, you know, have a view and not necessarily occupy it for long periods of time, but just to, to be able to retain that view and access. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the question is mostly coming from accessibility. I'm just thinking about people who have that are a little bit more mobility challenged and right. would like to get out there and then take a break before they got to walk all the way back. So, right. So we can um, we can definitely propose a bench or two out there and uh, it is accessible. That's the nice thing about the, the concrete sidewalk and, and keeping it at the high grade on that side towards Pages Lane. We can provide accessibility to it. Um, which I think is a, is a nice feature. Um, but yeah, um, we definitely could put a couple benches on, on there. Hey Russ, Thank I have a question. Sure. Um, I noticed they mentioned gas service was available. Is that the intent to use gas as the primary uh, um, source of uh, heating? Yeah, so we have um, brought ICDS on as the mechanicals. Obviously that hasn't started yet. We're get, trying to get our site plan approval at this stage. Um, 
So we do have generators on these, uh, they're in a vulnerable location. And so gas will be brought to these properties for, uh, for, for running of a generator, because there really aren't options um, that are viable. And, um, you know, so that is definitely going to come in and likely there might be some cooking. Um, I will say that we probably definitely are gonna incorporate air source heat pumps as a hybrid heat pump at the lowest end of our HVAC systems, but um, would likely entertain full air source heat pumps on these properties if the scale of the units and such with the, you know, um, you know, can be viable with the way that they're set up. So um, that is yet to obviously be determined. We're bringing the gas in definitely for generators, um, but we're open to looking to employ as much electric um, as we can. And I think we've had conversations with the owners um, about that being something, a criteria that um, owners probably are gonna be interested in. And about the north-south aspect of the roof, has uh, yep. PV been considered? It has. So um, design review was somewhat hesitant. Um, they liked the break breakup of the roof lines, which also breaks up the areas for um, solar access. So we do have a flat section on the very tops of all of the units that is um, to incorporate enough headroom for our elevators. So there is a fairly large area that has about eight to 10 kilowatts per unit that could be a low profile flat roof installation. And so I actually reached out to Aegis who's doing a study on it right now. Yeah, we are going to incorporate it um, as um, into the documents, I think as, um, I mean, ideally we would do it as a plan for the whole and actually incorporate it into the package to be sold. So everything is matching, but, um, but um, you know, at the very least we will accommodate the ability in the documents to allow for unit owners to to um, have access to the roof for solar. Have you also considered any other um, enhancements to the thermal package for the building or the windows or things like that? Are there these things that are coming up in conversation? Um, they are coming up in conversation. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I, we're definitely using probably the, the Marvin signature line. I don't think we're going to go, uh, you know, above that to, uh, um, uh, you know, to a triple glazed, um, you know, pass passive house rated window or something along those lines. I think um, just the market familiarity and uh, and and some of the, you know, some of the features and such is going to be something that drives us into that. But it will be, you know, their highest line. And uh, you know, we do have shading on the lower stories with our overhangs and our roof. Um, you know, so we've thought that through on the western side. We are doing all two by six construction. We'll do, um, you know, probably a, a flash and bat style um, that will be well beyond code, probably 30, 40% um, on res check beyond code, I would guess with the way that these are laid out, especially with the shared walls. Um, there isn't, um, we're, and, and I did bring up and we are looking if there's Energy Star or other certifications. I don't think we're gonna go beyond that to a passive house or to um, leave for homes or other certifications. Um, there just doesn't seem to be the market return on it with this particular, um, um, you know, from, from what we're hearing from the realtors, but Energy Star might be something that is, um, you know, uh, an investment we'll make. Okay, thanks. Um, Russ, as you're aware, we have a two meeting requirement and we still have a ton of material to go through. Um, and we also have some other action items. Um, so what I'm going to propose to the commission uh, is that we hold on um, going through the rest of it and have you first on our agenda for our next meeting, um, which will also give people that are here watching a chance to read through uh, materials from the town um, and potentially have questions for us on that. But I think you propose some great stuff and I think it's going to generate a lot of interest. Um, but I do want to respect the, the time of the commission uh, and hope you appreciate and understand that. I do. I do. <laughs> um, that being said, is the commission okay uh, with someone making a motion to continue this to our January 5th meeting? So move. Second. Anyone? Bueller? I think second. you got a second from Bill. Okay. Thanks. I'll call the vote. Sean Cosgrove. Sean, you're muted. Sorry. How about a thumbs up? You give me a thumbs up, I'll count it as a yes. Aye. Thank you. 
Frank D'Andrea? Yes, sir. Amy Stein? Yes. Richard Wallace? Yes. Scott Edmund? Yes. Bill Freeman? Yes. I'll also vote to continue. Thanks, Russ. I, I, I look forward to reading all the materials and chatting with you uh, and, and getting your take on them all and any responses to those materials as well at our next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, deliberation of public hearings. First one was do, 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 do. Gaudio Crystal Gaudio and, and David. Crystal Gaudio and David White. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Got it, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a coastal site plan application for Crystal Gaudio and David White at 23 Sawpit Road, map 34, lot 30, for a new house as shown on 23 Sawpit Road, proposed construction plan prepared by Duo Dickinson, architect dated November 5th, 2020. 2021. The application is approved based on a finding that it conforms with the zoning code and is consistent with the coastal management policies of the state of Connecticut. Do we have any conditions from uh, the, the Kevin on that one? I think we had the standard conditions, yes. So if we could incorporate the standard conditions per Kevin McGee. Uh, so we have a motion. Would someone like to second that? Second. Great. Uh, discussion? I mean, <laughs> God bless them if they want to pull a house down by hand. Um, but, you know, well, I, I was I was dumb enough to do that myself once. So um, We were I, all young once. I know, once. <laughs> once. Um, any other comments or questions? I'll call the vote then. Uh, all in favor? Sean Cosgrove? Aye. Frank D'Andrea? Aye. Danny Stein? Yes. Richard Wallace? Yes. Scott Edman? Yes. Bill Freeman? Yes. I'll also vote yes. Very good. Uh, next item was Matthew Griswold, special permit for construction of the barn. Uh, how about Sean? You want to grab that one? Uh, I think we'll put it up. I'll... Uh, I don't know if I have the motions. Don't have it. I got, I got it. it in front of me. All right, okay. Jamie, go for it. Sorry, Jamie, sorry. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Proposed motion voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a special permit for Matthew Griswold at 271 Three Mile Course, Map 79, Lot 20A for construction of a barn as shown on property located at number 271 Three Mile Course, Guilford, Connecticut, three sheets including elevation drawings prepared by Cruz Chiolo Engineering LLC, dated 10-12-2021. Uh, this application is approved with the following conditions. I believe there were also similar general conditions uh, from Kevin. Uh, this application is approved based upon a finding that it conforms with the zoning code. The special permit is effective on December 24th. 2021 and upon filing with the town clerk. Thank you. Have a second? Second. Any problems or questions on this one? It's just the barn, no plumbing, no electric, <clears throat> utility storage barn. Pretty straightforward. Yep. Yep, it is. I'll call the vote. Sean Cosgrove. Yes. All in favor. Sorry, Sean Cosgrove. Yes. Thank you. Frank D'Andrea. Yes. Amy Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace? Yes. Scott Edmond? Yes. Bill Freeman? Yes. And I'll also vote yes for the barn. Next item is uh, FJ Corsini 2 LLC 591 Sawmill Road, map 85, lot 63-1, zone R5, four lot resubdivision. Would someone like to make a motion on this? I have it. Okay, why don't you go ahead and read it then? <laughs> Voted. Voted that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission approve a resubdivision application for FJ Corsini Second LLC at 591 Sawmill Road, Map 85, Lot 63, 1, 
63-1 for a four lot subdivision as shown on site development plan project of FJ Corsini II LLC dated November 21st, 2021, revised to November 15th, 2021, and redivision subdivision plan of FJ Corsini II LLC dated November 11th, 2021, prepared by Waldo and Associates LLC. The application is approved with the, with the standard Kevin McGee's conditions and approved based upon a finding that it conforms with the zoning and subdivision codes. I'd like to mention that we consider not charging the fee in lieu given the history of the parcel. Okay. Second. Uh, okay, fine. I mean, technically it's a new application. So like technically it needs to have Isn't some accommodation yeah. for open space. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I feel like the parcel in general has been a loss to the to the tax base with all that confusion. That's about. not what Mr. Corsini is dealing with. Mr. Corsini bought a piece of property and paid for it with the uh, understanding through the land records that it was an approved project. Well, and I mean, then he got caught we, up. As we discussed, you know, technically it is an approved subdivision. We're just yeah. right. kind of re -approving. That's not technically what's happening. I mean, if you want to, if you want to say it's technically an approved one, then there's no reason for us to do that, it. Right that now. was my point when I was saying to, to I, I, you know, and, that, and I, and good point, Scott, I, that is exactly the point that we shouldn't even have been discussing this, but for some reason, this is the way it came through. So I feel so, yeah. some sense of, well, it's not, um, it's not sympathy. for some reason. That's the way, that's what your legal counsel. That's what our legal counsel suggested should happen. Yes. And, and the, okay. in everybody's interest, the clearest thing to do would be to reapprove it. We did debate, you know, a good bit whether or not you really needed to do that or not. Uh, and you know, Mr. Corsini, frankly, felt that you know he didn't want to have to do that. Um, but then it would get to the point where some he would apply for a building permit, and I would have to decide whether I should issue a building permit or not. And so everybody so fell in line with Chuck Anderson's advice that the clearest thing to do would be to redo it again. Now, so, what you have to do is wait. You can you can waive the requirement for open space, <clears throat> um, but it does it does require a motion to waive and then a vote, uh, and then you can act on the subdivision. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion to waive the fee in lieu of for the open space consideration? We will make that motion. That you will waive the fee. I will second. Okay. I mean, <laughs> not a perfect world. I mean, I wish it was, but it's not. Um, it, you know, in my mind, Mr. Corsini bought a property that was an approved subdivision and it was a, a paperwork snafu. And we're just fixing a paperwork snafu. So, to, you know, if, if in fact this was a single open lot now and we were technically Re, you know, receiving a subdivision, I think that would be a different issue, but I'm empathetic to being dealt a hand and then going from there. You know, obviously there are other issues associated with this and we can talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, but I'll, I'm gonna call the vote with respect to waiving the fee in lieu of. Um, Sean Cosgrove? Yes. Frank D'Andrea? Yes. Jamie Stein? No. Richard Wallace? Yes. Scott Edmond? No. Bill Freeman? Yes. I'll also vote to waive the motion carries. The fee is waived. Um, next is, uh, is there a motion? Do we have a motion to approve? You already did that. Yeah, right? I think it was read. OK, so um, discussion on that? So oh, everything's been said. It's we're we're sitting with what our council advised us. Right, and I mean, obviously, I, I certainly understand the concerns of some of the neighbors um, with respect to blasting. But I have confidence in our fire marshal in terms of properly protecting um, neighbors with respect to it. And obviously, if the developer I, does something that damages someone else's property, they're going to be responsible for it. I will echo. The, the fire department's 
has a very active role when it comes to blasting. A couple of years ago, we had blasting on my street. They did extensive pre-blast surveys in homes, in homes that had foundations similar to the one Gaudio and White had. Yep. Mm. Um, they do their diligence. Well, there's there's a there's a certain amount of feet that you're yes. required to notify the neighbors and you as a neighbor, if you fall within that, can choose to take pictures and yeah. plenty of plenty of safe. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to belabor this, but um, are, are these, um, will the developers be bonded for any damage they do to I don't. I don't believe George. I don't believe they're bonded. I just believe they're they're potentially uh, liable. legally liable. They're potentially liable. Yes. And the blast. The blasting companies are. Right. Yeah, they put seismographs if they're within a. As Frank said, if they're within a certain distance, you put a little machine well, I, on the ground. Yeah, but it goes beyond the goes beyond the damage to foundations. It goes to, you know, water supply. You know, their their wells. Yeah. It's, it's really not in our purview at all. And it's, yeah, it's I, not. It's also again, you know, there. If in fact they there is damage as a result of their activity, they're responsible for that. Okay. All right. Um, but so, in the same token, when the person says that they've had a well that's been underperforming already, it's really not. Uh, well, that, I, I I I tried to, to explain to Dorothy, I believe was her name, um, yeah. the importance of documenting her her case and and yeah. hopefully um they'll take that to heart and uh, but i mean i think you know proving something and claiming something is two different things so yeah um i this is jamie i i had less concern about blasting as i did for the just kind of lack of detail of the application i mean i had trouble making out where the proposed septic systems were i couldn't i really had trouble making out where the proposed wells were I had difficulty oh. distinguishing the soil types. Uh, I had difficulty distinguishing the grade of the slope towards Thirsty Lake. I mean, it, there, you know, it, I guess the question is, you know, George, is there another point in the sort of procedure of this subdivision in which more details about oh, there these is. elements will be? There developed? is definitely, and that's, that's a good point. And it, it really, gets to the issue of what is a subdivision. Right. Um, you're not approving, you're approving lots based on their compliance with the zoning and subdivision codes. You're not, you're not approving specific plans for houses or septic systems. What they're doing with the subdivision site development plan is demonstrating that they can build a house and a septic system in order to then justify your approval of the subdivision lot. They don't have to build the house and septic system in the manner in which it's shown on the subdivision plan, they can come back later with a different plan, um, you know, depending on who buys the lot and what kind of house they want to build and what, et cetera. What they've demonstrated is that they can build a code complying septic system and a house to meet the, meet the standards. And there is definitely a, a next step. It doesn't require approval of the Planning and Zoning Commission, however. It, they do need a building permit, and that includes a detailed site development plan, which is reviewed by, by uh, if there are wetlands, it's reviewed by the Wetlands Commission, uh, but it's definitely reviewed by wetland staff, by uh, zoning enforcement officer, by the town engineer, by the building official, uh, and they look at all those details, but it doesn't have to go back to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I was, you know, empathetic to the concerns about utility easements but we can't impose that upon right well and it's not necessarily true that they're gonna mess up that dirt path either i mean right and they may they may end up placing the uh electricity to that house from a different location if it turns out that right. they don't have the right to use that pole yeah right. that was what actually came to my mind is that yeah. uh, the the guy that's on the house that's already there may eventually just come off of the other side anyway Honestly, the biggest concern that. for me was that that septic on lot four is awfully close to the oh, 75 feet tight. to the well. Yeah. They're going to have to be super precise on that one. Right. We, well, that, that, that lot was discussed extensively as staff. It's definitely 
at the at the margin of what is you know yeah. feasible, but it it is on the on the positive side in terms of the code requirements. Right. All That's right. the one you get the surveyor out to stake it out for you. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we have a motion. We have a second. I'm going to call the vote. Uh, all in favor? Sean Cosgrove. Aye. Frank D'Andrea. Aye. Amy Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace. Yes. Scott Edmond. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. And I will also vote yes. So. Uh, next item. Okay. That was the George. That was one of the more interesting things I've ever experienced from a zoning That's, standpoint. Yeah, that was a very unusual one. I'll remember that one. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, again, coming back to process, there has to be someone saying, you know, there has to be a tickler in someone's computer that says, if this isn't filed by this, it's gone, and then put that in the deed, and and so either you do what you say you're going to do, or you lose it. Well, soon that, my that's soon the discuss. burden of the ninety days. The night that, right. that burden is on the property owner. Right. They, yeah, don't, file, they don't file the map in ninety days. It's isn't uh, it more on isn't more on the assessor's office? Well, if, at, if they don't file case, the map in, if they don't file the map in ninety days and expires, then why do we just see this application? Well, because the the uh, the unique nature of the action of the commission in ninety nine to waive the I mean to to approve a one lot plan. Uh, that that was a, de a debate that we actually had. Well, that one lot plan was not filed, and therefore that so, expired. So it goes, so it goes away. It went, back, it went back to four lots. Yes, that right. was an so argument that was made. Well, whatever. We, we it's, yeah, it's, we solved it. We <laughs> solved the problem for everybody. But, but in hindsight, but in hindsight, you know, yes. I know the onus is on the property holder. Well, the mis yeah, but also but the mistake should... is on the assessor, right? Like for not checking that's another the whole yeah. well yeah. yeah you know all right um next one christopher <laughs> healy boston bus <laughs> road map 78 lot 13 zone ts2 r8 petition for zone boundary change who wants to read the motion? i apologize we did not prepare a motion in advance on this but it's you know it's it's an up or down vote based on the compliance with the uh, plan of conservation and development Okay. Um, would someone, oh, I don't think George can, I'll make a motion. Um, make a motion to approve a zone boundary change for Boston Post Road map 78, lot 13, zone TS2 R8, petition for zone change from R8, R8 to MCU2. MUC2. MUC2. Sorry, I was close. Um, Alpha um, second. Thank you. Um, discussion? No, I Any, think we I mean, nailed it in deliberating. I mean, I think the obvious concerns is everyone wants to make sure that we um, protect the, you know, the Wolf Swamp wow. and Hobby Creek to the best of our abilities. But I think we're going to have, Inland Wetlands is going to have a lot to say about it. Um, I, I, I respect Kevin's desire to, to you know, do his very best to put forth a strong advocacy for hard protections, but I thought that was a lot. That was my take. Um, yep. So, uh, any other comments or concerns? I'll call the vote then. Sean Cosgrove? Abstain. Okay. Frank D'Andrea? Yes, sir. Jamie Stein. Yes. Richard Wallace. Yes. Scott Edmond. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. I'll also vote yes. The motion carries. Uh, and obviously, um, we make a motion to continue Eagle View. Yes, you did. Thank you. All right, we did. Yep. Sorry, it's eleven twenty-three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pending applications, Hubbard Road, uh, map 79, uh, I, zone I2, RE subdivision, two lots, been tabled to 119.22, Hubbard Road, LLC, map 79 has been tabled to 119.22. Um, do we have to officially table those, George? No, you've already done, you've already accepted them. 
Okay. Right, uh, these are applications, Bigliotti Construction, Receive and Set Public Hearing for 119.22, Sunset Creek Development, uh, 158 State, Map 46, Lot 27, Zone R1, Special Permit Subdivision for Two Lot Subdivision, Receive and Set Public Hearing for 119.22, uh, Ron DeGennaro, DeGennaro Development, Construction, State Street 54, Map 54, Lot 5, Zone MUOS, Special Permit for 25 Residential Units, Receive and Set Public Hearing for 119. Mm -hmm. And Paul De Silva, uh, Jardine, and Karen um, Bernaish, sorry about that, 160 mm -hmm. Sand Hill Road, Map 67, Lot 205, Zone R6, Special Permit, Coastal Site Plan for Accessory Apartment, Received for 119. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, other business discussed, uh, virtual versus in-person meeting for the new year. Um, <coughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm Omicron variant. I'm Omicron hesitant. Um, totally. And, and I, I am, I, I'm, I am too, Phil. I, I just think that, you know, my, my, and daughter-in-law just tested positive in Chicago. They were planning to drive out here next week, and they can't. I mean, I, I hate that we're still in that spot, but I, I think what we should continue uh, with our virtual meetings. Um, I do too. For the when does the executive meetings. When does the executive order run out? I I think we can go through March at least, can't we, George? April. Yeah, that sounds that sounds April. right. Okay. End of well, April. I mean, uh, why April, we can do April. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we, we revisit it at the end of January? Why, well, why don't we revisit it at the end you of January? Might as well. Yeah. <laughs> why don't we revisit it at the end of April? Why don't we do it when we get our next booster? Let me Hold ask on this. A second. All right. <laughs> um, George, oh, one, I guess one, George, have you guys received, or, or Lisa, have you guys received any requests from the public for this to go back to being in person? No, no, no. ZBA is going till April virtual. Yeah, there's we, no reason. We have the I, mean, I, I hate to be brutal. At, at one point, we had uh, 50 people at the meeting. Is that yeah. fair? Do you yeah. know all the Easily. engineers? All the engineers and the attorneys love virtual meetings. I'm sure they do. Well, that's. <laughs> Yeah, well, I still charge the same amount. People driving around, sit in their living room, and bill them at the regular rate. So, yeah, whatever. they love they them. They, they rave about them. They we, don't have to bring. They don't have to bring tripods and you know, <laughs> meeting room. I right. mean, they zoom in, they zoom out. Yeah, the the sound system's right. the before, we, before we get punchy, would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes? Wait, wait, From, I have a question. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Do we have the ability to offer a hybrid meeting? We do. Okay. Second question is, how are we going to handle our workshop for our zoning amendments? Uh, right now, we're leaning towards having a public meeting in the big meeting room in the community center where people can be really spread out. That's the way, that's the way it's set up right now. But I think that would be a hybrid meeting where no, that's well, not well, a the big room not, doesn't have the facility no. for that. Yeah, that would be just that would be a the old fashioned regular public meeting. That's and it fine, would right? be recorded, right? Concern. Like, we could yeah. have the video, we could have the videographer there, I think, couldn't we? Lisa? Yes, I yeah. booked a videographer. But right. we have we would yeah, have the not. whole room. I have it set for a hundred people, but it holds up to two hundred and fifty people. Right. So uh, George and I will have a conversation with it and I'll put out a group email to the commission to discuss the pros and cons of um, various options. Um, right. Thank you. I'm, I'm hesitant to gather large people indoors, but um, has anyone had a chance to look at the minutes and would someone like to make a motion to approve both the minutes for 11-3 and 12-1? I make a motion to accept the minutes for 12-3 and 12-1. Thank you, 11-3. Uh, Elementary, sir. I'll second this. They're substantially correct. Thank you very much. I'll call the vote. Sean Cosgrove. Yes. Frank D'Andrea. C. Si. Jamie Stein. Yes. <laughs> yes. Richard <laughs> Wallace. Yes. Scott Edmund. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. And I'll go with Bene. Yes. Bene. Bene. 
Can we have a show of hands? <laughs> By a show of hands with no further business and no bills in a long time, with no uh, further business before the Planning and Zoning Commission. By a show of hands, who would like to adjourn? Ciao. Hey, have a great Everybody holiday. Everybody has a Merry Christmas happy and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy Let holidays. the record show. Um,